<laughs> so first of all, thank you for bringing the freaking Portland weather. Here. I know it was like a rainstorm here in LA today. What's going on? It has not stopped raining. There was lightning storms last night. It was crazy. Did you get in this morning or yeah, last night? It was night? a very bumpy ride yeah. in this morning from uh, San Jose. So, so yeah. super wet out here today. Very Oregon. And then right after you have Jesse Thomas coming in. So a lot of Oregon energy. Exactly. <laughs> Oregon, the Oregon weather. rainy vibes coming in today. Right. Get ready. Um, super excited to talk to you. This is your third time on the podcast. It's an honor. I can't believe Every it. time you go knock out some crazy thing, you <laughs> come by and tell me about it. But uh, what's what's interesting? I was reflecting on our relationship a little bit. I mean, we, um, I think you you emailed me or reached out to me like years ago, maybe when we were living in Kauai because your dad has a farm there. Yes. And we tried to connect at that point when you were still racing triathlon. Exactly. I think it was uh, your first podcast is from Kauai, That's right? right? Exactly. Yeah. So right in that same moment, yeah, my dad has uh, lived on Kauai for almost 20 years. Now he's an organic farmer uh-huh. out there in Kilauea. And uh, I made, got made aware of you by a friend of mine, uh, Casey McGraw, who is a guy, I think like wrote a couple segments of the Epic Five maybe with you. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. he was my dad's uh-huh. first woman on his organic wow. farm, uh, moved out for a surf trip uh, from Florida and ended up, he's still living there, married uh-huh. my next door neighbor and they've got a kid and lives right. on Kauai. So um, he got bit by the bug. But yeah, I think that's how I got first introduced you. What was that, 2010, 20, 11? No, it was, uh, that was 2012. 2012, okay, yeah, yeah, 2012. Yeah. And then, yeah, I was racing triathlon professionally at that right. point. And I think we we did, we connected over Twitter or something like that. But We never, we never hooked up though. Yeah, we, exactly. But we did uh, hook up in New York City. Yeah. Uh, like what was that like two months ago or something exactly, like that we exactly. were staying in the same hotel you would literally it was like two days after you completed this journey and you went straight to new york city like i think you had your sled with you still <laughs> yeah, i did i still had my sled <laughs> you hadn't with even me. been home yet <laughs> and we were texting you're like hey i see you in your new york i'm in new york let's uh let's try to get together i'm like great i'm bouncing around pretty busy but where are you in the city we both text each other the same address right. and realize we're sitting in, in the same two floors away from each other yeah so. and then we ran into each other in the elevator my favorite part of this story is um i was I was going out to some fancy dinner and I was all dressed up in a blazer. And then I come out of the elevator and there you are in like a nice coat, like, you know, (laughs) like, like, uh, you know, good Yale grad. And I was like, where are you going? And you're, you're going, you're on your way to CNN, which our hotel was literally two blocks away from. And I was like, oh, great. You can just walk down the street. That's awesome. And (laughs) And I was like, I was like, yeah, but they, uh, they sent a car because they're worried that if it got a little snowy, I couldn't handle it. So (laughs) that's hilarious. It's pretty hilarious. But yeah, two, uh, you and I, a couple West coast guys trying to look all fancy, uh, for the New York city folks. I know that's a rare occasion. (laughs) Yes. Very rare. Um, and you've just been on a tear. You're in like a new city every single day. If you watch your Instagram stories, it has been nonstop since you've been back. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a blessing. Um, but it's funny when I saw you in New York. I got back from Antarctica on January third. Um, spent a few days. Jenna came down and met me um, down there. Of course, my my lovely wife and business partner. Um, and she came and met me down there. And we took a couple days in Chile um, before going back. But she was uh-huh. like, "Hey, we're not flying back to the Portland actually. Back home, uh, we need." you in New York City to be on the Today Show. So going from 54 days alone in a tent in Antarctica with nobody else to the bright lights of New York City yeah. was uh, a little bit jarring. But like I said, it's been a blessing and I'm really you know humbled by all the press and media attention around yeah, this. Yeah, crazy attention. It's been amazing. Uh, Adam Skolnick did an unbelievable job of chronicling you know this from day one and Absolutely. keeping everybody riveted. I mean, there was just piece after piece after piece in the New York Times. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, and uh, the, the Adam connection actually originally comes via you because right. I think when he wrote that article about you doing Otillo, Otillo or however uh-huh. you pronounce that, um, he had reached out or you had reached out to me to see how he wants to interview a couple of people been on the podcast and uh, him and I became friends from right. there and he did such an extraordinary job with the New York Times pieces. It That's was cool. uh, incredible to see and it was originally supposed to be one or two pieces but I guess they liked it so much. So I think uh-huh. they ended up doing seven or eight or something like that and building this whole tracker around it. I didn't get to see all this yeah. in real time of course but it was happening uh, kind of as a back here when I was uh, out on the ice. Not only was the coverage riveting, they did an incredible job of of displaying it graphically, like yeah. in a very artistic way that was immersive, that yeah. was very cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so here you are, man. <laughs> uh, the last time we spoke, you had just completed the Explorer's Grand Slam, setting the world record on that. Like you just go from one thing to the next. And then 
uh, right before this Antarctica e- expedition, you did fi- the 50 tallest summits in the in the United States yes. in like 21 days. 21 days, 50 points. Yeah. I tried to get you to come out and I come know. out with me. I know, you emailed me and you're like, C- at least come and do this one. I was like, dude, it'll be a blast. <laughs> that is a, a, one of my big regrets, not yeah. doing that. Yeah, that was, uh, it was a good time. Yeah, that, that journey was a wild one. You know, for me, um, you know, creating these projects, you know, setting these world records is kind of, you know, a fun piece of this, but uh, it's been fun to really start to think of myself less as an athlete and more of as an artist. And as I create these projects, you know, what sort of positivity and vibration I can send inspiration out into the world. And also, how can I get people to participate and collaborate with them? The Antarctica Project, being alone in Antarctica, of course, didn't in person have a lot of collaboration yeah. uh, potential. But the 50 High Points was a blast. Um, with that project, Jenna and I kind of created this concept that we called the Forrest Gump Effect. And so we invited anyone else I was racing across the United States to come out and join us, climb a mountain with us, you know, climb a peak. Of course, on the East Coast, some of these are little like hills. In Florida, it's a 325 yeah. foot you know hill on the side of the road. But we had a whole bunch of teachers come join us out there, school kids on on various paths, and so that project was so fun to see all 50 states in that period of time, but also meet all these incredible people in all these different locations was really really fun. But to do it in 21 days, <laughs> I mean, I can understand 50 days, but 21 days you're doing at least two a day. Yes, yes. Logistically, so, that must have been super tricky. Yeah, Jenna is a logistic mastermind, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, the way that project works is basically the world record clock starts ticking when you reach the summit of the first peak. Uh-huh. And so in this case, uh, Denali was very first because, of course, that's the longest to get up. Right. Um, so I went out there with uh, a climbing partner, a really good friend of mine, a guy named Dr. John Kardowski out of Colorado. Um, so he climbed that peak with me and uh, we strapped skis on from the summit and got back down as quickly as we could. So we literally summited Denali, got our skis, packed up our camp, skied all the way back down to the little um, airport, or not airport, Airport, but a landing strip out there and a bush plane picks us up, flies us back to Anchorage. John stays there and packs up our stuff, but I get in a car and drive straight down to the Anchorage airport and Alaska is like closing their, um, the, the airport door is closing. We uh-huh. get the last person on the plane that flies us straight to Hawaii and it just starts from right. there. So we go Alaska, Hawaii, fly back to the mainland United States and kind of work our way east to west and have kind of two modes of transport. We've got an RV, uh, had this amazing Cruise America RV, but we just lived in out of my whole crew. There's about five or six of us, filmmaker, Jenna, uh, my friend Blake, a couple other folks um, were there with us, which was amazing. Um, And then we kind of drove our way up and down the East Coast from place to place. But then also um, one of my main sponsors, a company called Standard Process, who played a huge role in Antarctica as well. We can talk about that from the food standpoint. Um, But they let us use, they were like, hey, do you want to borrow our time machine? And I was like, I like time machines. What are we talking? (laughs) Like, what's this? And they um, they let me use the company plane for a few of the segments. So on some Uh, of the really hard to get to places. Um, I got to hop in a, a private plane, That's which was a very, plane. very first for me. Um, and I think that probably saved two or three days off. It didn't, it didn't save quite as much time. It wasn't like, didn't save like 10 days or something off it, but a few really crucial flight segments uh-huh. um, were huge in there. But basically we did about 10,000 miles on this RV, constant motion. So either the right. RV's driving, I'm sleeping. And if we get there, we get to a place at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning. It's like, all right, Colin, get go. out. You got to go, gotta go, go climb. Um, and it's, it's each piece, Peak for uh, there's a different peak in each state. Yeah. So like, what's the peak in Nebraska? Yeah. You know, so or I mean, like Kansas. Yeah. So there's, I mean, obviously some of these were these, you know, smaller peaks. I think uh, in Kansas it was called uh, Sun Sunflower Mountain, uh-huh. uh, Mount Sunflower. Actually, that one was incredible though. We arrived and we had gotten a little bit delayed that day. I was coming from uh, actually, so Mount Whitney got closed. We get there to Mount Whitney and a huge lightning strike had happened right at the trailhead. So I'm about to climb it. My dad actually had trained. It was his 60th birthday that day. July 11th of this past year, uh-huh. and he was going to climb it with me. He's been that's one the of my... one that I was going to join you for. Exactly, exactly, and that actually got got disrupted because of this lightning strike. They're like, we're not letting anyone in in there right now, and uh-huh. I'm on this world record clock. I'm like, wait, look, what should we do? Fortunately, uh, we realized we still had to hit Arizona. So we popped over to Arizona that morning with me and my dad climbed Arizona, Humphreys Peak, and then needed to get Nebraska and Kansas before going to Colorado. And uh, so we fly out there. We're a little bit delayed. We hit Nebraska, which is just a drive up, basically. Take a quick photo off, you know, uh-huh. tag the you know, 1,000 feet above sea level or whatever. And then we get to Kansas at like 2 in the morning. 
At this point, we're thinking, no one's going to join us for this one. Obviously, we're trying to get people to join us, this Forrest Gump effect. But we're like, you know, like it's 2 o'clock in the morning, middle of right. nowhere in western Kansas. I mean, it's very rural. It's not near any of the cities. And sure enough, we get into this parking lot, and these lights flash. And there's this kid, um, is incredible guy, who had seen on the Instagram that we were coming out there, was at work that morning, and said, sorry to his boss. I got to go do this. And drove eight and a half hours Whoa. from the farther side of Kansas to join us at the top of Mount sunflower and which is uh, what like 2000 it's it's not like it's not even a climb it's (laughs) like basically a parking lot and Uh like a little plaque and uh he gets out of his car he's like oh my god you're here this is amazing like he was like so psyched and i was just like you know just humbled that he was so excited and the best part about it was like he's like dude i've been sitting here but i didn't have any food or any water so we had like given food and water to him (laughs) um and i was like so what are you gonna do are you gonna like just grab a hotel and then drive back in the morning he's like he's like no man i gotta clock in for work at 8 a.m so he was literally (laughs) getting back in his car driving all the way back home and going to work so massive shout out um to him uh for joining us out there it was incredible and so when does the original idea for the Antarctica expedition pop into your head? Because you didn't announce it until super late into yeah, the game. Yeah, so even while we were working on the 50 High Points, which was a blast, um, you know, we've been working on Antarctica kind of in my mind for about two years. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of 2016, Jenna and I, you know, we've, we've kind of built these projects, you know, really kind of from nothing. There's a little bit more infrastructure around us uh, these days. Um, but, you know, when we started out, it was just literally a one-bedroom apartment and a whiteboard with us some ideas like, hey, should we try this? And it was like, we don't have any sponsors. We don't have right. any marketing background. We know nothing about how to pull these things together. I didn't even have that much background in, you know, mountaineering um, at that point. And, uh, you know, we kind of just pulled it together on a shoe screen. But um, that's where these ideas kind of were created. It's just the two of us just ideating. And that one, this, I have a whiteboard that says, you know, the race across Antarctica in 2016. The reason that had come to my mind wasn't just out of nowhere. Of course, um, you know, going back as far as Ernest Shackleton in 1914, you know, he attempted to do a traverse of Antarctica with his whole team and of course that was an ill-fated expedition but one of the greatest like adventure mm-hmm. stories in my opinion of all time where everyone and his crew you know survived incredible leadership principles but then in the modern era um you know what set this as part as a world first is important to kind of distinguish which is <clears throat> You know, no one had crossed the landmass of Antarctica solo, unsupported, which means no resupplies of food, and then unaided, so not no use of kites or dogs or vehicles or anything like that. Um, but people, of course, over the past hundred years have figured out how to do that. You know, using kites and things. Some really extraordinary expeditions have happened, but this sort of really pure form of just man hauling hadn't been accomplished. And in 2015, um, right at the same time that I was starting the Explorers Grand Slam world record in Antarctica as well, a guy named Henry Worsley was attempting this crossing, um, and so I was just fascinated by his project following along because I was in Antarctica for my very first time doing a much shorter expedition across the last degree of latitude and climbing Mount Benson as part of the Explorer's Grand Slam. And Henry and I arrived at the South Pole about, I don't know, exactly a few days apart from each other. He was there Mm -hmm. just before me. So I never met him, Mm -hmm. but was just aware of this kind of really epic expedition taking place. And unfortunately... Um, you know, about a month later, 71 days into his expedition, he fell ill and then ultimately passed away um, as a result of complications of the sickness uh, that happened with him out there, which was, you know, terribly sad um, and, you know, also received a lot of media attention that sort of kind of people started asking in the media, like, is this crossing even possible? You know, can humans carry enough, you know, food without being resupplied and the weight of the sled's too heavy and kind of all these sort of, you know, armchair questions, you know, kind of kept happening. But, um, you know, in the zeitgeist of exploration, there was a curiosity there. So the following year or two years later, a guy named Ben Saunders attempted the project as well. Um, a prolific, um, you know, polar explorer out of the UK as well. I mean, he's done some really pioneering stuff in the North Pole, South Pole, really amazing expedition, somebody I've looked up to. Um, and I thought for sure when he was going to attempt it, I was like, oh, wow, like Ben's doing this. If anyone's mm-hmm. going to do this project, it's going to be him. And Jenna and I, you know, had this idea in the back of our mind to try it, but we weren't in place to do it this year and was just kind of cheering him along and following his blog. And then sure enough, on a about, you know, day 50 or 51 of his expedition, he arrived at the South Pole and made the call that he was running too low on supplies and wasn't going to be able to complete the full traverse. And so he had to get picked up at the South Pole, which kind of opened the doorway um, for me to give it a shot the following year. Right. And at what point did you become aware that that Lewis Rudd was going to make this attempt also? Yeah, of course. That's, uh, you know, the, the big factor here. So Antarctica, you know, for those who don't have general context on it, which is pretty much everyone, understandably, because um, it's frozen mm-hmm. desolate place in the bottom of the world. Polar, um, <laughs> polar, polar bears, right? Yeah, exactly. No polar bears even. Yeah, That's a common no. misconception as well, like we talked about before. But no, um, 
the, the, you know, the, there's only one season really where you can do a crossing of Antarctica, um, and it's the Antarctic summer, basically. And then the logistics are very, very limited down there. Um, there's really only, you know, one company that services a couple of planes that supports expeditions and scientific research. Um, and it's a really, really specific set of kind of window. And so if you're going to try this project, you basically need to be down there at the very beginning of the season with the same guy who owns like the one plane who can right. drop you off on the edge of the continent. Um, and so Lou Rudd announced that he was going to attempt this in March of this past year. I had already been working on it quietly in the background, um, but I wasn't super surprised, to be honest, to know that somebody else was going to be attempting this, given sort of um, the fanfare that this project had been getting. And Lou um, was an expedition partner of Henry Worsley's on a right. previous expedition, so they were yeah, you know, he dear friends. He kind of devoted his expedition to yeah. them, right? and super, I mean, super mm-hmm. noble. Like I said, Henry was an inspiration of mine from afar, um, but I never actually met him. But Lou, of course, is, you know, really involved, and they'd done on a 68-day expedition together in Antarctica and our close friends from the military and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so Lou announced his project, um, which didn't really change my you know, decisions or tactic in any ways. Um, but uh, I didn't actually publicly announce my project, as you mentioned, until about a week before leaving for Antarctica, even though I've been working on it for well over a year. Right. And I would imagine part of the impetus is looking at these other people who have attempted it and had been unsuccessful and thinking like, Nobody's done this. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe absolutely. It's a crack, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, uh, I always admired the, you know, the pioneering explorers of yesteryear, you know, like reading Ernest Shackleton's book or Teddy Roosevelt, you know, going floating down, you know, through the Amazon. Um, or of course Sir Edmund Hillary being the first to climb Everest and stuff like this. Just these iconic people that, you know, to me are still just in this amazing pantheon of exploration. Uh-huh. Um, and I kind of felt like, wow, I was born too late for this. I was born in 1985. Um, you know, we've got, you know, a lot more modern technology there, satellite mapping, like, you know, is it, you know, is there a difference between exploration nowadays? Certainly than it was back then, um, you know, yeah, these iconic, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, you know, <laughs> I have this vision of like uh, a place like the Yale Club in New York, like wood paneled walls, <laughs> yeah. with like, you know, paintings of dogs hunting where these <laughs> old adventurers sit and, you know, regale people with their stories of yes. these, these like, <laughs> You know, the Sir Ranoff finds exactly. you know, tradition of exploration. Exactly. And for me, like, I've just been fascinated by that for so long. And, you know, even even now having completed this crossing, I don't necessarily, you know, put myself right up beside them in my mind. They're still just my heroes in, in a different category. Um, but they, you know, for me, I was like, wow, like, there is this iconic first that remains undone in Antarctica, which is this solo, unsupported, unaided traverse. And so for that reason, um, it was fascinating to me. Um, and again, just as a way of... Of one, exploring the own kind of unlocking the own potential inside uh-huh. my own body as an athlete, an endurance athlete, but also this sort of curiosity. It's one thing, you know, these other world records I had set, you know, being the fastest person to complete certain things um, was unique. No one had ever done it as fast. The seven summits to explores Grand Slam or the 50 high points, but people have completed those things. And so it was different to step into this kind of unknown of like, wow, people have attempted this and no one has done it. Like, why? Like, where did they get it wrong? Like, how can I kind of try to figure it out better? Is it even possible? And that's why Jenna and I ultimately named the project The Impossible First and at this kind of nod at, um, you know, not not poking fun and not being kind of cocky or anything of actually mm-hmm. literally going like, is this possible? Let's let's try and find it out. Um, and there was no, there was no, uh, you know, there's a good possibility in our minds that it wasn't going to be possible yeah. or that we would fail, but I wanted to give it my best shot. So being a student of that legacy and kind of trying to deconstruct, you know, these past expeditions, was there something that you identified like, oh, here's where they went awry or here's where I can correct this mistake? Like, what did you, what did you kind of discern from looking at those past expeditions to try to figure out what you would do differently so that you wouldn't, you know, befall the same fate. Yeah. You know, one of the things, and it's uh, apropos to be on your podcast talking about this, but really was the nutrition. Um, you know, I looked at some of these other expeditions and there's kind of been this, you know, old school polar exploration, which is like, get super fat because you're going to lose a lot of weight, eat uh-huh. a bunch of cheese and salami and, you know, pemmican, you know, whatever bacon or whatever, frozen bacon, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, and I've, you know, as you know, I, you know, I run a small nonprofit that's, in, you know, around inspiring kids to get outside, move their bodies and live active, healthy lives, really focus on health and wellness with young people. And just being a product of a, a father who's an organic farmer and a mother who's, you know, in the natural foods industry in the Pacific Northwest, you know, I'm to have this deep curiosity around whole food health and nutrition. And so I was like, okay, 
I wonder if like you could get that just the nutrition piece of this really right. How much of a difference would that make? Because it's ultimately this massive, massive math equation where it's unsupported, right? So you can't put any extra things in your sled. Every every ounce you put in your sled mm-hmm. is super important. And Ben Saunders unfortunately didn't quite take didn't quite take enough. Um, Henry's Worthley bodies, you know, broke down because maybe he wasn't getting the right nutrition and calories. I don't know for sure, but that was sort of a question that I had. And so I found this amazing sponsor, this company called Standard Process. You might be familiar with them, but it's a whole food supplement company out of Wisconsin, incredible operation, you know, a thousand acre organic farm, vertically integrated, you know, all work with, you know, chiropractors and acupuncturists. I mean, just an incredible, you know, sort of high ethic company. And I said to them, I presented this idea. I said, hey, I want to try this. And people are calling this product Project impossible. I mean, I think there's a quote from Wired Magazine that says, it's humanly impossible to carry enough calories to get your mm-hmm. body across Antarctica. And I said, you know, hey, I knew that they were opening this nutrition innovation center this year in Charlotte, where they basically assembled some of the top doctors, you know, food scientists, um, just really smart people around sort of food, health, and nutrition. And they could figure out, could we figure this out? And so we spent a year with them. I did, you know, several hundred blood tests. I was in their endurance lab, you know, running, VO2 max testing, body fat, all all this kind of stuff. And ultimately the byproduct of that was to come up with a custom food solution that would fuel me, which was ultimately all plant-based. Um, and it was whole food. It was basically, they created what they called the column bars, which is <laughs> kind yeah. of a, a funny name. You had a chance to try them, right? In uh, New they're York good. when I saw you. I like yeah. them. Yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're not too bad. They're, they're quite good. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically solving this equation of trying to, to, pack the most amount of calories and nutritional density into the least amount of like net weight that you're going to have to pull. Yes. And so when you underwent all of these studies, the VO2 max and the blood work, what was it that they figured out from your specific, you know, genetic makeup or predisposition that informed how they came up with that formula? So they started out by doing food sensitivity testing just to find out where the inflammatory markers were around food. Um, Some of them were obvious to me because things that I've just known in my past, which is, you know, like peanuts, I just never really agreed with me super well. Um, What else? There was, uh, you know, red meat. It's just Mm -hmm. something I've eaten a lot of throughout my life. I was kind of raised on a more pescatarian diet just in general with the way my parents ate as a kid. Um, That wasn't a huge surprise to me. But then there were some weird ones. It was like ginger, um and bad like, or good bad meaning, for me bad. Just, not not like bad in general right. but just inflammatory markers yeah, for anything me anything that's going to pr- promote inflammation yeah because your body is under so much stress out there even in you know day-to-day life probably a little ginger for me is totally fine but mm-hmm. in this sense we we're trying to like minimize inflammation because my body was going to be under so much stress so we're trying to find what would burn the absolute cleanest in my body and then from there, we kind of have to figure out what the macronutrient blend is, like how much fats, how much carbs, how much protein, of course, that was super important and needed to be basically pretty high fat and ultimately solve for that, mostly using coconut oil and then also nuts and seeds and, and veggie protein and things like that. But the real, I think, difference maker in addition to figuring out that macronutrient blends was these phytonutrients. So they were able to find in my body, like, what am I deficient in? What do I need more of? And what's going to break down over time? So the bar was a combination of the right macronutrient blend using, you know, fats, you know, proteins, et cetera. Um, but then also they were able to grind up their whole food, you know, or whole organic supplements into this bar. So I wasn't having to take a million different pills or things like that, but it was, you know, ground up, you know, it's like, you know, magnesium and, um, you know, you know, very, you know, probiotics and things like that, promoting gut health. The gut health was the biggest thing that I kind of came in and they were like, look, like your, you know, your, your gut health is not as dialed as it needs to be. And we think over time, if you're not digesting and absorbing these calories properly, um, you know, you were going to fall apart out here. Yeah. So. so what? So what was the nutritional profile then? So you have coconut oil. What else was in it? Dates. Yeah. Um, so it was like dried cranberries, uh, chia seeds, uh, pumpkin seeds, um, uh, veggie protein. It's like a pea powder that the uh, pea protein powder uh-huh. that they um, have. And then um, there's actually uh, one of their uh, products is also a protein, but it was mixed with um, this like a slow burning carbohydrate blend. Basically, um, I don't know exactly all the various parts, but it's again all or- organics, um, you know, ingredients in there. Um, but it's uh, but that was amazing because instead of kind of these spikes, these kind of sugar 
spikes. It was this longer burn. Mm-hmm. Um, like you lower know, glycemic. Exactly, lower glycemic right. stuff. And that's perfect because I'm, you know, zone one, low yeah. heart rate the entire time and dragging this heavy sled. But it's, you know, you know, slowly and methodically, there's not these like anaerobic bursts. So I wasn't like burning those like fast stores of glycogen in that way. So, right. yeah. Um, are they going to package this thing? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. There's, of course, <laughs> here's how you lot. get fat, yeah. actually. Yeah. There's but a, it's so specific to you. Yeah. Well, exactly. It's you a know? funny thing. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's really cool. They, um, you know, right when I got back, you know, Hoda tried them on the Today Show and then right. Bryant Gumbel, we just did HBO Real Sports with him and he's in my living room trying them. And so like, I mean, it's gotten some sort of like yeah. high profile looks. I know, you've got like uh, a, a lead here, you exactly. know. Exactly. <laughs> and so a lot of people have been reaching out, of course, to Sandra Process say like, you know, when can we get these column right. bars? Um, and there's kind of two responses. One is, you know, that bar was really specifically tailored It's called to a column me. bar for a reason. Um, and it also, you know, I was burning about 10,000 calories when I was mm-hmm. out there. And, you know, these bars put in about, these bars plus what I had kind of on either ends of it in the day, I was eating about 7,000 calories. That's about as much as I could carry. And I was still losing weight. Now, if you ate 7,000 calories in a day-to-day life, we all know that that's probably not, unless yeah. you're training super, super hard, the perfect makeup. But what it has asked, begged the question, and I think, you know, there's something that, that you know, we are exploring a little bit, which is a custom food solution. The idea right. of like, you know, why are we not fueling our bodies in these custom ways? And of course, there's some barriers to that, but is there a way to do something that isn't quite, you know, a year long study of all this blood work and all this, this, but in a more simple way to understand mm-hmm. some sort of genetic makeups of our bodies and what, what cleans, you know, the burnest burns, the cleanest in our bodies and fuels it. That's the future yeah. of, of nutrition or at least performance nutrition. Absolutely. I think, you know, I mean, this Colin bar would be ideal for you in an Ironman, I would imagine Absolutely. with some electrolyte element to it as yep. well, some hydration strategy. But, you know, if you're an elite high performance athlete and you have the resources to be able to get that kind of information that you can drill down on to f- figure out and solve your nutritional dilemma, I think would be a massive competitive advantage, especially when, look, as a professional triathlete, look at Ironman, look at these yes. guys that are at the absolute tip of the spear, the best, most highly trained, and they're still running into problems with nutrition when they hit, you know, mile 10, mile exactly. 16, on, on, and they're start, they start to throw up on the Kona course. Yeah. It's like, there's yeah. a lot that GI still distress, can be you know, figured out and learned to solve those kind of problems. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think that, you know, it was fun to have, you know, this incredible company behind me with all the support that they threw my way to create, you know, what we mm-hmm. did. But what I'm really excited about and what I kind of, you know, said to them a year ago when I presented them was, I was how amazing would it be to come back from this? Hopefully it's successful. Hopefully there's some media buzz around it. And when I get asked questions like this conversation we're having right now, like, how did you do that? To be like, we solved this with whole food, health, and nutrition. And by the way, we collected all the data and science on it. So in the next, you know, several months, we're planning to, you know, publish a medical white paper, peer reviewed, and you know, a proper science journal mm-hmm. on that to actually just show open source. Like, here's how we did it. Now, does that that doesn't trickle down to the retail product tomorrow? But that is the beginning of this sort of iteration, or at least you know, adding our sort of research to the larger bucket of people looking at custom yeah. health and nutrition, and hopefully, um, you know, that can build to scale at some point in a way that really can reach a lot of other people, or certainly high performing athletes at first. And I think there are the future of health in, in some ways yeah. is, is finding this. Out and actually dictating our health and nutrition around that. In a business context, it's a case study on the perfect um, relationship between uh, athlete and sponsor too. Yes. You oh know my what god. I mean? Because it it's so it it so seamlessly integrates with your mission and what you're doing. And now here you are talking about it still. You totally. know what I mean? Like that's the way all those kind of relationships should function. I mean, it's it's been an absolute blessing having been a professional athlete now for nearly a decade. I've been fortunate to have, you know, some great partners and great sponsors along the way. Um, but, you know, nothing has been, you know, this for me is like, it's not like a commercial for standard process right now. You're just asking me, how did this no. happen? It's like, this is what I did. I had this incredible partner and we did this amazing thing. And I'm so excited to talk about it because I'm just passionate about what we did from the most authentic level of the whole food, healthy nutrition yeah. and solving this high performance question, not with some weird chemical derivative or isolate it, but actually being like, yeah, like it's whole food nutrition around my genetic profile with a bunch of smart people in a room solving this math equation. Like we did it and it was successful and we did something that literally no one in history has ever done with the human body. And it's just a really fun, you know, fun to be able to reflect on that in the way that's sort of the most meaningful to me and my background. And you did it plant-based. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not only the first person uh, to cross Antarctica unaided, but you did it as the first plant-based person That's right. as well here. That's right. So, you know, we can celebrate that. Um, let's talk about the, uh, the preparation for this in terms of fitness training, because I think what's also interesting is that, 
you know, kind of hearkening back to this tradition of great explorers, these people come from a very different kind of background and lineage. They tend to be people from the military. Like Lou came from special forces, right? I mean, the guy had done like seven tours in yes. Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq. Exactly. Like, that's a more traditional uh, kind of background for this kind of thing. It's what's unique about you is you're coming from a professional athlete background. And, um, you know, in the way that you approached nutrition more scientifically and differently than what had been done historically, your your athletic preparation for this was also like finely tuned and, and pretty unique and interesting. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's I, I agree with you, you know, exploration and, you know, whatever you want to call them, action sports and, you know, or you know, mountaineering, things like that haven't necessarily always been in the more traditional athlete char- right. category. And it's been fun to see, you know, some athletes that I really admire kind of crossing over into this, you know, a guy like Achillean Jornet, right. um, who's obviously one of the greatest athletes in the world, but also has all the technical mountaineering skills mm-hmm. to do incredible things, or certainly what Alex Honnold just just did, you know, um, or even Steve House, you know, publishing books about like how to actually train for the new alpinism, how to be, you know, think of yourself as an athlete to think about climbing mountains or doing some of these things. So it's fun to see that building, but you're absolutely right, which is the traditional background in these types of things hasn't been necessarily professional athletes taking them on or even a training protocol that is, is of the similarity of a professional athlete. And so for me, you know, approaching it with that mindset, having been a professional triathlete for a number of years and really approach things in that way, it was fun to look look at this problem, but also it was completely unique to me. You know, I, you know, when I was racing triathlon, you know, I'm six foot tall. My race weight was probably about 158 pounds, something like that, you know, maybe low 160s at times. Um, and that was clearly not going to cut it. Like that right. lean build was not going to cut it for Antarctica. Um, it was very clear to me after sitting down with standard process, like I needed to put some mass on my body, not only to be stronger, to pull this 375 pound sled out the gate, but literally because we knew I was going to be, you know, withering away yeah, and losing. To lose. Yeah, I needed something in the bank to lose 100%. So we targeted putting me up to about 185 pounds, which we ultimately did get me there. It felt weird to be that. I've never been that big in my life, mm-hmm. um, but to get my sort of body weight up that high. Um, and so I was like, who who can coach me? I've had some incredible coaches along the way in my life, of course, through my swimming career, triathlon, et cetera. Um, I kind of wanted, you know, a different take on this. And so uh, kind of via, you know, I don't know, just a couple of people making some introductions. I got introduced to this guy named Mike McCastle, um, who's based out of Portland, where I'm from. And he's an incredible guy. He himself has four world records, but in things very different than what I've done. There's these very strength-oriented things. He's done uh, 5,804 pull-ups in right. uh, 24 hours or something like that. The world record in that. He pulled um, an F-150 truck uh, like 20 miles across Death Valley or something like that. I mean, and he's like this soft-spoken, you know, has a background. He was a, a, a Navy guy, not Navy SEAL, but he was a, a Navy guy for a long time, air traffic controller there. And he's a young guy. He's in his early 30s. Um, and he trains and trains athletes out of this gym called Evolution Fitness by my house that has this altitude chamber. It's a cool place to train. Um, but anyways, I got connected with him and immediately we just kind of synced. Um, not only because I was like, well, this guy knows how to pull heavy things far, clearly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and he's down the street from me. He's just you. down the street from me. But he also is this high-performing athlete that really looks at things from the mental side as well. And ultimately, my curiosity with Antarctica, as much as it was physical and that there's some serious physical demands out there, which is our obvious. Mm-hmm. The mental side was my deep curiosity. You know, what happens to the brain, you know, 54 days alone in this expansive white landscape, nothing to see on the horizon, yeah. the sun never setting, you know, can you can you harness the power of that or is that going to completely defeat you? That seemed like that was going to be the make or break. So Mike really designed this training protocol for me that really encapsulated both of those things. Yes, we got me stronger. I did a lot of, you know, squats and deadlifts and bench press and, you know, getting like bigger and stronger muscle mass, um, more weightlifting than I've probably done since. I was a collegiate right. swimmer, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I haven't done that kind of work in a long time. But then a lot of body weight stuff, a lot of plyometrics. But ultimately, the kind of crux of this was this combination of this hardcore fitness, you know, weight training with the mental side. So he started doing these circuits for me where he'd get my heart rate jacked up really high by doing all this sort of, you know, you know, running on this treadmill uphill, you know, lifting weights, all this kind of stuff. And then he'd have me put my feet in ice buckets, sit against the wall, do a wall squat. But then he would start yelling like, you know, fractions at me to math problems. 
problems right. or he'd hand me a Lego set and be like, solve this Lego set. Or my hands would be in these ice buckets in a plank position. And then I have to pull them out and tie knots with ropes. And there's this idea of in Antarctica, completely alone, no one else to rely on myself. I had to be completely locked in both mentally being able to calm my mind with my heart rate jacked up with the storm literally raging around me. But if I tied a knot wrong or if I let go of my tent and that blew away, I'm in the middle of Antarctica alone with no tent. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For lack of a better word. Absolutely. So it, uh, it was intense, but the training was amazing. And it was one of those moments when I found myself in Antarctica several times in these brutal storms, you know, setting up my tent in a minus 80 degree wind chill when it's minus 30 out and 50, 60 mile per hour winds, just brutal conditions. Um, and I'm going, oh, if I freak out right now or if my mind is not calm or I'm not executing like properly or I'm exhausted at the end of this, you know, 15 hour day or whatever it is, like, you know, this is how you lose your life or this right. is how you get into big trouble. And so that training with Mike, both combining that physical and the mental in these intense environments was just an incredible way to train and prepare for this. You know, yeah. hat tip to Mike for sure for what he did there. Yeah, it's those little things and something like that, like some tiny little thing that you overlooked or that you screwed up because you didn't have your mindset right that yeah. end up like upending the the entire thing. For 100%. And the Antarctica, you know, the the crazy thing when I compare, you know, polar expeditions to, you know, Himalayan mountaineering, you know, climbing an Everest or other bigger expeditions I've done in the mountains is you know, there's in the mountains, there's probably more objective hazard, meaning, of course, there's there's avalanche risk. You could, you know, fall down a big cliff. Um, both Antarctica and mountains, of course, have crevasses, um, but in varying degrees. Um, and so there's that kind of that heightened intensity in a mountain, but even in, you know, Himalayan mountaineering, you might climb up to a couple high camps, but then you might sit there for four or five days, mm-hmm. relax in a base camp, go down the mountain, rest and recover and wait for that kind of epic one epic summit push. Whereas in Antarctica, it's 54 days and it's nonstop every single day. So I didn't have enough food. And of course I'm racing Lou. Um, and so I didn't have enough time mm-hmm. to basically take a day off in 54 days. I didn't take a single rest day. So that meant if it was, you know, like I said, 50, 60 mile per hour winds, I was out of my tent, not going, oh, I should take a shortened day. It's a full day. It's a 12 hour, 13 hour day of pulling my sled. But then on either end of it, it's two hours of melting snow to create water, you know, putting my boots on, you know, to, uh, packing everything up, which is not easy when the wind's blowing and everything, and then setting the tent up and doing all this, as well as, of course, trying to share this story with the world. So I'm posting, you know, on Instagram every single night, I'm carrying this satellite yeah. modem that is, you know, posting the sites. It's a whole sort of process of the days in which, I mean, maybe that doesn't sound like a lot, but there was no day that wasn't 17 hours long for 54 days in a row, completely by myself having to do every task, shoveling snow. And so every sequence of the day, one little misstep in any of those, you know, hundreds of details throughout the day could, you know, begin a sudden disaster for sure. Yeah, no question about it. All right, so just to be clear, you have this sled that you're gonna be pulling and it ends up weighing 375, right? Yeah. Yep. 375 pounds, not an ounce more or less <laughs> after, you know, basically, uh, you know, analyzing this thing six ways to Tuesday to try to figure out like, what are the essential things that I need and not one thing more? Yep, right? exactly. And so how much of that is, so it's, it's your food, obviously. How much did the food weigh? So the food weighed, I think it came in around two, 220, something like right, that. Right, 220. Yeah. So that's a, you know, significant portion of it. And that's obviously gonna decline yep. you know, over time. Then you have um, you have your tent, yep. you have your stove, yep. you have your sleeping bag, yep. you have extra gear, I would imagine. But a little you, bit. You didn't bring a lot of backup gear in case stuff broke. Yeah, so kind of once you started weighing all the components of the sled and realizing, you know, 375 was a stretch for me um, to even be able to pull at all. Um, and definitely couldn't have been any heavier than that. And it was pretty much on my limit right at the gate. Um, and so I realized I couldn't bring any kind of extra anything. So the other big weight component that you didn't mention there, which was fuel. So the way that you get water, of course, right. is by melting snow. And so that, of course, is white gas. Um, I took about about 15 liters of that. And so that mm-hmm. weighed, you know, another 20 or so pounds um, there. Um, but, you know, food and fuel were the main things, but there was not enough. It was like extra ski. Nope. Can't bring that. Like extra tent. Nope. Right. Can't bring that. I mean, I literally didn't bring an extra pair of underwear. I didn't change my clothes the entire time for 54 days so that I could get an extra like hundred calories of food in my sled. And, uh, you know, I was right down to it at the end there. I was down to my last <laughs> bag or so of food. So it was, I mean, the calculation is very tight on being able to do this crossing without being resupplied. So every, you know, out little ounce uh, mattered. But I mean, honestly, that first day I, uh, I get, I get dropped off, you know, Lou and I get dropped off actually a mile apart from each other. Mm -hmm. We're equidistant from the first waypoint, the first kind of GPS marker on the map. 
And, uh, you know, we had been, we'd built a sort of a bit of a camaraderie, but there's clearly a little bit of tension and, you know, we're both wanting to be first at this thing, yeah. but we're still on the same plane and we're realizing we're both attempting this thing. So it's not like we wish ill on each other. You know, we give ourselves each other a hug and say, Hey, you know, I hope you make a safe and successful crossing. But I think in the back of both of minds is like, but I hope I'm first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, I'm looking at his gear and I'm like, man, this guy knows his stuff. Not only does he have this military background, but he's actually done more miles in Antarctica man hauling a sled than any person in history. So he's done at this point about, you know, 2000 plus miles. Now after this expedition, three, th- more than 3000 miles in Antarctica. And I've done 69 miles in Antarctica on this much smaller expedition on the last degree of latitude, of the punk. Explorers Grand Slam. I'm this like young, you know, upstart yeah. American kid um, coming in. Of course, I've done climbed a lot more mountains and done stuff than him. And so it's not like I don't have a background. But he's I did. the dude when it comes to Antarctica. Yes. And he brought an extra pair of skis. And he did bring an extra pair of skis. Um, but what somehow his, his, what did his way out at his, so his, his this sled ended up being about 40 pounds lighter than mine to start um, because he took, he was eating less calories per day. He was eating mm-hmm. 5,500 calories per day, which ultimately um, in the end, he lost about 40 or 50 pounds and I lost only 20 pounds. Um, I think that was a big difference in the end. But, but he, had, he had more food left over at the end. Though. He did. So it's very interesting the way that like we kind of, we definitely had different strategies, 100%. Um, and I'm not, and I will say on the very first day I get dropped off, um, I've got my sled, I'm packing it up. Before I take even a single step, I'm actually securing stuff in my sled. And I actually used uh, a secondhand sled. Believe it or not, I, I solved for all these things. But I, I found a sled of an, another guy who I knew in the UK, and he let me, you know, use this sled, which he'd, he had taken to the South Pole before. So I'm figuring, oh, like this actually is a, you know, battle tested sled. Um, so it's, it's good in that sense. But I reached down, and I pull the strap tight on the sled the first time. I haven't taken a single step, and ping, the uh, right. the strap breaks. Right. And I'm like, oh this god, is this is well. going to be a long trip, a thousand miles to go. Um, and so I, you know, I strap, I strap everything down. I, I get going and I go for about an hour or two and I am just suffering. I'm actually, there's a video clip of me, but I'm crying. I'm actually crying underneath my goggles and I now have, um, frost on my nose because the tears are literally freezing to my face. And I pick up my satellite phone. I call home to Jenna. I'm like, so Jenna, um, I think we may have named our project the right thing. It appears that, uh, this is impossible. And I see Lou like disappear on the horizon, just like strong and steady, like in this sort of like like I said, military march, and he clearly. I was like, "Wow, he maybe had a better strategy than I did here." And so that was a right. tough moment for sure, so, right out the gate. So just to back it up a little bit, because I want to track through this, yeah. um, in a logical manner. So Lou had been public about doing this much earlier than you. Yes. So I would imagine when suddenly at the last minute it was like October when you announced that you're doing this, and you guys ultimately end up pushing off like when, like early November? November 3rd, yeah, so this exactly. Is like just weeks beforehand. He must have been like, the fuck is this guy? Yes. What's he doing, right? So what happened the first time? And I think people are confused. Like, why are you guys on the same plane? Like, why is this happening? Because you have this window, right? It's yes. the only way this is going to happen. So the first moment that you meet him, it must have been awkward. He must have been like, what is this guy doing? Yes, this is yes. My, this is my thing. So um, certainly, you know, I think that he was, uh, he, he wasn't thrilled and he certainly wasn't happy that I announced so late. Um, I certainly, you know, that was a, a strategic advantage to kind of wait until the last minute, although I didn't kind of make up that strategy so in you're, general. Here's the thing yeah. with you. <laughs> you're like a smiling, friendly, very affable guy, but- Underneath the surface, you're a competitive beast, man. Like I don't trust you. Yeah, oh man, you know don't trust I mean? me. That's tough. No, Rich. like you got there's there's like uh, there's something like really competitive underneath this like friendly veneer. You know, I absolutely. You, you, it would have to be in order for you to go and do these things. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I was you know passionate about trying to be the first in this case, and that was. It's interesting because two things happened. One. I felt very competitive with Lou. And for me, it was like, absolutely. Like, not only am I racing history here, but I'm racing Lou head to head. But at the same time, I also have this like great respect for anyone who's putting themselves out in this environment. And so it was this weird kind of interplay in my mind being this competitive athlete that clearly is a big part of me, but also somebody who generally like resonates love and compassion and empathy. And so I actually found myself every single day was kind of a gratitude practice that I just generally have of sending love and positivity towards Lou as well as being like, I'm waking up early this morning so I can go more miles right. than you. And so it's this interesting interplay. But yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, you meet him, it was weird at first, so right? We so him, how do you get over that? So we met in uh, Punta Arenas, which is southern Chile, where you take the cargo plane that ultimately takes you to Antarctica. 
Um, and at this point, Adam Skolnick, uh, the New York Times, he had come down um, to, to um, cover this story. Uh-huh. Um, he wasn't going to be able to come to Antarctica because it's ridiculously, prohibitively expensive to go to Antarctica that way. Um, but he, the, New- the Times sent him down to, Antar- or to Punta Arenas. And so the, they set up like a dinner or a meet and greet for Lou and I a day before we're both uh-huh. flying down to Antarctica. And you hadn't um, met him yet. Never met him yet. I had sent him one email um, just to say, actually the day before I announced, just say, hey, by the way, tomorrow I'm announcing this project. I'm also doing this, you know, wishing you all the best luck. We should probably talk because we're going to be, you know, doing this at the same time, maybe co- make some coordinations, but, you know, nothing else. Just want to introduce myself and say hello. And I got back a, a, a somewhat a terse. Uh, yeah, very, <laughs> yes. What did he say? <laughs> yeah. You know, for me, it, you know, good luck, buddy. It just, it was just kind of like, you could read between the lines of like, oh, this young American who doesn't understand the history and respect. You know, it's this, it's this interesting dichotomy. There's right? a protocol. He's, yeah, like yeah. you have to put your time in before you step up to something like yeah. this. Yeah, and um, but and you know, etiquette. but I will say, uh, although that you know that first email wasn't the, the most pleasant to receive from him, and the first time we met, you know, there was there was although kind of below it, you know, some maybe, you know, some competitive nature, it was generally pretty affable. I mean, we met and it was a little bit awkward and all these reporters are looking at us. They want to take a picture of us like shaking hands before Uh this duel across Antarctica. But also, you know, like I said, you know, his, his friend died three years ago trying this thing. You know, he's doing this for an incredibly honorable cause. He's raising money for these military charities, things like that. And, you know, I think once he got to know me a little bit better, he realized like, oh, like this, you know, this is a guy, like you just said, like, yeah, Yes, he's a competitor. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's trying to do this. But at the same time, like, it wasn't like I was like, don't look at me. It wasn't like some, like, uh, like I picture like a M&M, MMA, like Conor McGregor, like, you know, right. press conference or his trash talk. <laughs> yeah. like, it couldn't have been. I mean, you know, we had a right. drink. We chatted. He told me about his story. I told him about my background. You know, we weren't like giving up our like exact strategies or anything like that. But like, it was friendly. Um, mm-hmm. Although, albeit a little bit awkward. But yes, yeah. there's only one logistics operator. So we literally ended up on the same, um, the same place we actually he originally was going to take a different route than i was going to take and so we didn't know we were going to be dropped off at the exact same point but the day before we get dropped off he actually came to me and said hey i'm actually being dropped off at the same point as you based on some of the other logistics and weather in the area and things like that and so in that moment it was like all right this Damn is not on. just this is not just a race from different points right. of this this is like actually dropped off same point same moment same day ready go <laughs> so they drop you off but Ultimately, you start like a mile apart from each other on a parallel track, right? Yes. So it's not like you're standing right next no, to the guy. No. And it's like, go. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I yes. mean, I guess it could have been, No, right? it could have been. They you actually, know? that they were like, they sort of suggested that. And we were kind of like, that would be like pretty weird. And you're like, these sleds are so heavy that like, you're going we're at a go. snail's pace. Like, 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 <laughs> yeah, you know, just inching forward. So fortunately, yeah. they, you know, a parallel plan, like you said, equidistant from the first waypoint, but one mile apart from one uh-huh. another um, to begin. But I mean, a mile in Antarctica, you can see on a clear day, and it was a beautifully clear day when we got dropped off. I mean, you can, you can see, see forever. Right. I mean, you literally, I mean, so miles, you're like, oh, he's just like right there. And like I said, I'm struggling. I'm crying in my, my yeah. ski goggles. You told that story, him. you told that story uh, at that little th- gathering I went to in New York, um, like taking that first pull and just being like, this thing's not moving at all. Yes. Like, what have I got myself into? I mean, it was it was brutal. And like I said, picking up that phone call, not one of the proudest phone calls I've ever made, but to tell Jen after we spent a year of our life planning and doing every little detail with standard process with the food and trying to get everything perfectly right to like come out on that first day and go like, oh, maybe we didn't get it right. But or, you must have like, t- taken the sled out and on ice to test yeah, it, right? But the thing is, is that it's, it's really hard to tell. And this, this was something that I kind of know more now. Of course, I didn't have as much of experience as Lou did. But really what dictates the friction more than anything, of course, is the snow conditions. And of course, and, you know, uh, academically or logically in my mind, I understand that, but it's very different to be like, oh, if it's loose and unconsolidated snow, a 375 pound sled feels like a 600 pound uh-huh. sled. But if it's this icy, you know, sheer, you know, veneer surface, it's going to feel like a hundred pound sled. I mean, right. so the same sled on different snow conditions. And this had been an El Nino year. And it just turned out that actually it was one of the most difficult uh, expedition years that Antarctica 
America has seen in a long time. In fact, Lou and I were the first expeditions to be dropped off that season. No one else was attempting this full traverse, but people were attempting various, you know, coast to pole crossings or there's some smaller, you know, group trips down there Mm -hmm. and several expeditions, big expeditions from some guys who are really talented, a British guy who has a world record, one of the other bigger polar explorers in the U.S., all had to abandon their projects about halfway through because they got stuck in such deep snow, they couldn't move their sled. And so Lou and I encountered that straight out of the gate. And that was me going like, oh, like it's not just how heavy my sled is that I proved I could pull it in a gym or in a test Mm -hmm. situation, but being out here. And also that first day, it was overwhelming. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like I get dropped off. I'm in the middle of Antarctica by myself. It's minus 25 degrees. I know I'm not going to speak to anybody for months. Like I'm afraid that like some bad weather is going to come in before I kind of hit my stride. I'm just overwhelmed by the entire emotion and the vastness of this entire situation. It was just one of those, you know, tough moments of, you know, fear, doubt, all the things kind of creeping up in your mind um, and having to persevere and push through that. So that first day, you wanted to get to that way. Jenna's like, just get to this way station. Yes. So how, what was the distance of So that? actually, it was actually, the first waypoint's actually the start. So you get dropped off on the ice shelf. So you're at basically, uh-huh. you know, frozen sea water, frozen ocean, essentially, that you're standing on. You can't really visually tell the difference between where the continent starts and the ice shelf because it's very, you know, deep um, ice at that point there. Um, but the plane dropped us off so that we could be equidistant to the first waypoint further out on the ice shelf, about three miles, like adding three miles to a thousand mile journey didn't seem like that big of a Mm -hmm. thing so that we could be separated at the start um but that first waypoint is really like the starting point and i'm already failing before that so i'm like jenna's like how far are you from the first waypoint when i call and i'm like i'm like 0.63 miles like i might as well say it's a million miles but i'm saying it's like you know half a mile basically she's like okay look like just get get to that first waypoint set your tent up you'll feel like you made some project progress and we can kind of you know recalibrate from there and so i finally make it to that first waypoint it was brutal I get in the tent. I'm exhausted. I've only been outside for three hours because we got dropped off later in the day. And so it wasn't like a full day of Uh, pulling. Um, and so I get in that tent. I, I call Jenna again that night. So we had planned to have a safety call every single evening um, just to ensure she could kind of check in on my mental acuity and just kind of check in on how I'm doing. Um, you know, it's not like inexpensive to like, it's not like I was chit chatting on the phone, like, right. <laughs> you know, but you know, important to make this phone call to her. And uh, she's like, look, tomorrow is going to be really hard, obviously. But I had been really curious about these flow states and kind of these meditative places that I wanted to find in my mind. And so I've been telling her that all in my training. And she was like, she said to me, she's like, Try to find the flow tomorrow, even if for 30 seconds, even if for a minute, like just try to find like that inner peace. It's going to be hard out there. And so I remember the next morning I woke up and it was kind of a pivotal moment for me, which is kind of embarking on my first full day. And uh, I'm a big believer that, you know, we are the stories we tell ourselves. There's been various mantras with me throughout different times, but this mantra just kind of came to me in that moment. I woke up on that first full day and I said out loud to myself, I said, Colin, you are strong, you are capable. You are strong, you are capable. And that kind of became like, like my mantra every mm-hmm. morning from from then on out, and I getting out in the conditions that day. Lou was long gone on the horizon. Yeah, I was he, just focused. Blew way ahead. Of yeah, you. yeah, I was focused just on my own, like just making progress some way. And you know that next day was brutal. I think I made it, you know, eight and a half miles. One of my you know sl- lowest, slowest, most challenging days. But I remember late in that day, kind of eight and a half, nine hours into that day, I tapped into this flow state for a minute. Like I just found this like minute of calm in this ten hour day of just brutal like suffering. Suffering. And it was just that first glimmer of hope of like, oh, like if I can figure out how to get my systems right, if I can just kind of calm my mind a little bit. I mean, imagine as a swimmer or as triathlete, long things you've done, you've tapped into that place from time to time where you're like, oh, like there is a way to kind of calm this down, but my body can actually function at a pretty high level. But when your mind is racing, like, it's yeah. too heavy, I can't do this, all these things, you wind yourself yeah, up. Yeah, it takes time. Yeah. You know, the body, it's like there, there has to be this merging of, of body and mind where it finally syncs up and it's like, oh, okay, now I understand what you're doing here yeah. and I can like accommodate this. But at first it's a manic, chaotic thing until you kind of settle into, okay, this is there's a rhythm here. Absolutely. Right? And you know, for me, it's funny because I'm I feel like I'm confronting the opposite of this coming from all the solitude and being back out in the world and doing interviews and things like this. Now it's the opposite. Like I was unwinding from being in that digital world, planning my project, all the last limit logistics, you know, flying and planes and all this kind of stuff to all of a sudden like I'm alone 
it's quiet, it's still. And I hadn't found that stillness within uh-huh. yet because um, I was still, like you said, in this sort of right. manic phase. Um, but getting that glimmer of hope on that first day was really important to me to give me that confidence that if I continued with this process day after day, that hopefully I would find that on a more regular basis. So you had this strategy of breaking this up into like an interval workout, right? Like eight times 90 minutes. Yeah, so my original strategy, um, and I had kind of played with this, the the other expedition I'd done in training is I did a crossing of Greenland, um, not alone uh, with a group of other people, but I tried to kind of operate autonomously as much as I can to sort of simulate the the alone. But this was just uh, two months before Antarctica. Um, I went and did that, it was 400 miles. And there I kind of found this rhythm of going for 90 minutes and being able to take a quick break. You know, the most important thing over a long duration, I was going to pull my sled for about 12, hours plus per day is, you know, I'd have breakfast inside the tent in the morning and then dinner at night. But in between all, I mean, I'm just eating these column bars and I realized it's not like you're going to have like one big lunch and like pour 4,000 calories into Mm -hmm. your stomach. It's more like an endurance event where you're going, you know, this kind of steady dole of 100, 200 calories at a pretty, you know, steady rhythm. And so I found that every 90 minutes I could, you know, take a break pretty short break where I could drink some water and eat some column bars and refuel and kind of keep my sort of glycogen stores, right. you know, on an even keel throughout the day. But it's crazy. In Antarctica, you know, you actually get pretty warm pulling a sled. There's this there's this phrase which is, you know, you sweat, you die. You really yeah, like this don't. Is, I want to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you can't sweat when you're out there mm-hmm. um, because, you know, the second you sweat, it's fine for the moment you're sweating. But the second you stop, I mean, your body temperature and the clothes on your body will literally freeze to you. You go hypothermic within a matter of minutes. And so it's this kind of this comfortably cool of like pushing hard enough to keep your body warm and get w- warmed up, but not hard not enough that warm. you're sweating. It's just this weird thing. But the second you stop. So as a result of that, sometimes I'd have relatively thin layers on. But to stop and take a drink of water, I would need to put my huge puffy jacket on within a matter of, you know, 10, 15 seconds. So in the front of my sled, I'd have my thermos, which is how the water didn't freeze, um, and then a big puffy jacket. And so I would stop after 90 minutes, put this huge puffy jacket on, even if I was only going to stop for two or three minutes, put the jacket on and then drink this warm water out of my thermos, eat some column bars and put it all back in the sled and, and take off again before I got too cold. Right. So when you're moving, you're basically stripping down to like base layers, right? And what is the ambient temperature? Yeah, so the average ambient temperature throughout the journey was about minus 25 degrees, which... uh, It seems crazy to be in... (laughs) It's crazy. I mean, it's insane. How could you... (laughs) <laughs> be moving and like not be absolutely freezing no matter how much clothes you are wearing. Yeah, I've I tried to like describe that cold in, in different ways of like, you know, it's like, oh, we understand that's really cold, but I realized like the best way I, I can describe no it way of understanding if, that cold. Is there's a there's a photo that I actually used in my TED Talk a couple years ago to try to describe this cold and I took a cup of boiling water on that expedition in the South Pole in 2016 and I threw it in the air and it immediately turns to ice like in this puff of smoke. Right. So boiling water to ice in an instant that kind of gives you a sense of of how cold this is. And that's with no wind. And of course, the wind chill can, you know, ratchet down, like I said, minus 50, minus 60, minus 70 degrees um, very commonly. But it's a bizarre thing. Our bodies are capable of keeping themselves pretty darn warm when we're moving. But the second we're stopped, that just completely changes because uh-huh. that heart rate, you know, you know, drops. And so, um, yeah, there were days, particularly when there wasn't wind. When there was wind, I pretty much always had to have at least like my Gore-Tex like jacket windproof like layer on. Um, but a lot of the time, you know, there were there were days when it was still in common, minus 20, minus 25 degrees out, where mm-hmm. I would literally be down to a base layer, like just a base layer, wow. you know, hat, goggles, gloves, like all of that always pretty much. But, you know, you could get warm, but it would also be like, you'd be like, okay, I need to, st-. it was more like I was changing at all times. Like I'd be like, okay, I need to be down for this jacket for 20 minutes. Okay, now I'm a little bit too cold. Put the jacket back on and switching and this. And that's when it's really easy to go like, oh, it's such a pain in the ass to like change the, my gloves again or like put this jacket on. That's when you can just really kind of like let your guard down. But that's when you go like, oh, but now I'm sweating or oh, but now mm-hmm. I'm too cold um, and my body's shutting down or whatnot. And so it was kind of, I think of it as like uh, an airplane pilot, you know, with this constant checklist of like the safety check like how are your feet how are your hands are your, is your nose okay how are your feet how are your hands are your nose okay how's your body temperature mm-hmm. how's your food supply how's your this and kind of just constantly running this checklist in my mind which became second nature eventually but seemed like a lot to keep up with at first of kind of it's almost like you know a vipassana meditation or an awareness practice yeah. we're just constantly being aware of each inch of your body and how it needs to either change or how you need to you know make an adjustment to stay in this kind of you know homeostasis or kind of calm kind of quiet um you know temperature There must have been days where the conditions were really good and the snow conditions were smooth, where you felt like you could just 
haul some ass, yeah. right? And you have to hold back. Oh, right? yeah. Because you can't sweat. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, you know, there's the, the, the epic storms and the battles I had out there are, are maybe more exciting to talk about. But yeah, there were days where it was calm. It's blue skies. You could see forever. You know, the ground conditions were good. But in those days, yeah, it's, it's like you just said, it's like, okay, now you're tempted to be like, okay, I want to push like super hard, but like you can't, yes. it's not like you can just like run around out there. I mean, uh-huh. the sled's still super heavy. Um, and so, yeah, it was like, it, it was a lot of patience um, required day by day. And it really required just being in this methodic process. It was, you know, incremental gains. And those 90 minute sections, one of the reasons that I started breaking my days up into that, because even a whole day just seemed too long at first. Like it was just like, break it up. So it was like, okay, I wake up, I say my mantra, you're strong, you're capable. Then the next thing Uh I do is I light my stove. You say it out loud? Yeah, out loud to Uh myself. Why not? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Shout it out. (laughs) Um, The next thing, light my match, light my stove. Okay, that's the next part of the day. Okay, on that point, while the water's boiling, I'm putting my socks back on. So I'm putting, I basically, stuff would get wet throughout the day with ice and snow, the condensation of my breath on my mask and things. And the only way to dry that inside the tent really is to put it inside of your sleeping bag or against your body. Um, And so all this stuff would be inside my sleeping bag. There was actually a couple of times when I was having trouble with the skins on the bottom of my skis, and I literally had to put my skis inside my sleeping bag to, as to well thaw them out, to thaw yeah. them out. So and were so, you barefoot in the sleeping bag when you were sleeping? I actually was. I actually found that I slept the best barefoot and allowed my, uh, I would put my socks down my base layer pants so that they would dry against my skin. Um, and actually, there's an interesting thing that you do with your feet, or that I do with my feet anyways. I know some other guys that do this in really cold places, but I would have a thin base layer sock on, like a really, really thin sock. Um, and then I would put a plastic bag next over my feet. Um, so literally from my, uh, from my oatmeal in the morning, there'd be a bag that I would, you know, use every single day. And I would put that over my feet. Mm. And then over top of that, I would put a thick wool sock. And then of course mm. my boot, which is really warm. And the reason I would do that is it would create a vapor barrier inside of my sock. So if my feet did get a little sweaty, which of course I didn't want them to at all, but if they did, it would just be that one sock on the inside. Because on a long expedition, if you start sweating inside of your boots, of course, your socks get wet and your feet get cold. But what actually happens is the boots, no, the boots themselves start to collect Uh, snow and condensation in them. So keeping the inner soles of your boot, and they're never going to dry. There's no way to really, you know, get them as dry as you would But putting a plastic bag on your foot is going to cause your foot to sweat, right? Because there's no breathability. So so that is a, that's like the one exception to the rule. You're not going to wrap your body in, you know, you know, plastic. Saran wrap. But in this case, to keep the boots dry, it was almost better to have this kind of, you know, hot plastic bag around your feet uh-huh. essentially at the end of the day. So my feet were moist at the end of the day, not like dripping in sweat or anything, but they right. would build up a little bit of condensation in there. But yeah, that all came out of my sleeping bag. And it was just these incremental parts of the day. It was like, okay, then I take them out of the sleeping bag. Then I pour the water in my thermos. Then I do, I mean, it was like that sequence of the days. And it was almost like just looking at these little incremental steps throughout the day, then the totality of the day or certainly the week or the months that I was out there was way too vast. It was just having to break it down in these compartmentalized things and see if I could repeat the same day over and over and over again in this strange sort of meditative monotony. Right, without like losing your mind. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you have this great story about um, overtaking Lou. So you're about seven days in. Yeah. Or you start, you realize you're gaining on him, right? And there's a little bit of like uh, tit for tat where you guys are passing each other a little bit and your tents are you yes. know, it's like this sort of dueling thing. You can see him in the distance. Yes. So walk me through that experience because I think psychologically it's super interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's an intense moment for sure because after that, like I said, that first day I see him disappear and I think, you know what, I just got to execute gone, my right? plan. Um, and you know, this will be what it will be. The competitive juices are still flowing, but I'm also like, I got to survive out here. I got to prove that I can move this sled. I got to, you know, so I almost forget about him for the first little bit, but then sure enough on the sixth day at the end of the fifth day, I see, you know, his, uh, tent far on the horizon. So I push a little extra far that day to get kind of within striking distance of his tent. I set up my tent only probably about 15 minutes away from his tent and the closest we ever camped to one another. And then I wake up early the following morning thinking, you know what, maybe I can kind of get a little bit of a jump on the day. And I wake up and it's a whiteout day, complete whiteout. And when it's whiteout, you know, as expansive as Antarctica can be when the sun's out, uh, I mean, the sun's always up 24 mm-hmm. hours a day, but when there's no clouds, um, it's the opposite. It's like this myopic, like insular experience. It's just white on white. You can barely see one step in front of you. And I've got my compass strapped to my chest and I'm looking down at my compass, um, you know, navigating in this whiteout. And, uh, you know, I 
see Lou, Lou's tent, and I try to kind of go go around him a little bit, um, just to give him a little bit of distance. But it's like you can't really go extra distance. We're trying to go in the same direction. And as I'm passing his tent, I see that I hear the sound of kind of this cough and this unzipping of the tent. And now Lou kind of pops his head out of this tent and gives me this kind of surreal wave. And it's just this bizarre moment of these like two wow. competitors, but also out in the middle of nowhere, right. this whiteout in Antarctica. Was like, this in the you, morning or at the end of day? It was early. It was early, early in the day. Right. So you were get you got to jump on him. You yeah. started your days a little bit earlier than he did. A little bit earlier than he did, and uh, yeah. So I end up I end up passing him, and I'm, I'm continuing on. You know, kind of trying to stay focused on my progress, and it's really challenging to navigate in the whiteout. Um, and this is one of the first major white. There ended up being tons throughout the entire project, but it's day six, and this was the first like really bad whiteout that I'd have. So I'm kind of just kind of getting my bearings quite literally with my compass, trying to find my way, um, and it's tough. And I look back. And, you know, Lou's taking his tent down and here he comes. And I was like, oh, like it's a whiteout. I'm in front of him on the same path that he's trying to do. You know, whether he's doing it purposely or not, doesn't matter. It's like he can see the bearing in mm-hmm. me. So it's probably easier it's like for him you. to navigate. And I'm thinking, wow, did I just get like taken smart. by another veteran yeah. move? <laughs> like he's like, yeah, yeah. I'll let you kind of go total, in the way. Yeah, that's a total yeah. sensei move. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that he was like, you know, going in my tracks to like go faster, nothing like that. It was just like, it's white out. You can see nothing, but you can see me up in front of him and he's fine. It's like, it's just easier. Like it just is. Yeah. The mental duress is yeah. much less. Right? And, um, so sure enough, it, you know what, it didn't go on like that for very long. Um, and he pulls up, he pulls up beside me. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, he kind of, he kind of just strikes. It was, it's really, it's just this bizarre moment. And he pulls up beside of me and kind of strikes up a pretty casual conversation. He's like, Hey, good morning, mate. Like, you know, everything all right with your harness. Cause the way I pull my harness is actually, it looks like it's kind of messed up. Uh, visually, but it's just the specific way that I pull it and I know that it's fine, but I can see why he's like looking at me like, and I'm like, is this guy going to like critique my like pulling technique? Or like, right. what's he like? Or is he like is trying he, to like, get in your head? Is he trying to get in my head? Is he uh. this and that? And so I just say to him, I cut him short and I just say, I say, hey, Lou, look, we both know the stakes out here. We both know there's a ton of pressure on us. You know, this is a really intense moment. We're both meant to be out here solo, unsupported. Like, let this be the last time that we speak to one another. And it wasn't, I wouldn't say it in like a rough or mean way. It was like, yo, like I'm sending you love, but like we're both out here on these solo expeditions. Of course, we might tit for tat cross each other's paths in some weird way like this. Um, but, you know, let this be, you know, we're not going to be out here like chit chatting to one another. Because it, just, it could be a reason that, people would would say that that constitutes support. Absolutely. I mean, if certainly if the continuation of the expedition, I mean, like I said, we were, you know, beside each other for 15 seconds or something. Uh-huh. We had like the most briefest of all conversations. Um, but yeah, of course, if we were beside each other for the next week or two weeks, it'd be like, well, that's not a solo expedition. That's you right. guys like out here together and whatever. So, you know, we crossed each other's paths in this moment. Um, and like I said, we had had given each other a hug, you know, at the starting line and kind of, you know, at this moment, just kind of like look each other's eyes. I remember him kind of putting his goggles up and I can see his eyes and he's like, all right. Like it was just kind of this like coy smile. I couldn't read into it. And I was like, is he messing with me? Is he not? Or is he just like being a you know normal person? Or was person? he annoyed or, by you or, saying that? Or like, yeah, or was he? Yeah, I didn't really know. Um, but it was super brief, and it was just like kind of like okay, like both of us just like kind of looked at each other again, not in this like rough or combative way, certainly in a competitive way, but in a way that was like, okay, because we both know how hard the journey is in front of both of us. And we like, we, of there's 7 billion people on the planet. Like there's one other person like going right. through this other thing. So you can't help but have some like and love and compassion towards that. We're day six, you know, we mm-hmm. think it's going to take 50, 60, 70 days. And so it's like, Hey man, like best of luck to you. And so we split up, but it's of course funny when you try to split up in an article, like you said, it's like two tortoises racing each other. It's like, it's not like we're like, we're okay, separated. See you later. Yeah. It's like that thing where you're like, <laughs> say goodbye to someone and then you both turn the same way outside <laughs> exactly. the door. Yeah. You walk next you walk to each other. You walk around and you're down the same elevator and you're like, yeah. oh, hell yeah, a little chit chat. So anyways, um, so anyways, yeah, we, we spoke, like I said, a few sentences to one another. We, we split up and I decided in my mind that day, I was like, wow, like, Clearly, I think Lou probably got his gear a little more dialed than me. He's definitely got a lighter sled. He's got more experience than me. Um, But I was like, I'm going to stay out here longer than him. 
So I kind of got it in my mind that day. And I was like, okay, if Lou goes for 10 hours a day, I'm going for 11 hours. If Lou goes for 11 hours, I'm going for 12 hours. You know, I'm really going to try to just go further than him that day. And so he eventually, we, you know, we weren't right beside each other. We were probably divided by, you know, as much as a quarter mile or half a mile, you know, one, maybe a little bit in front of the other, then someone would take break and, you know, eat lunch or whatever that was. And it was kind of, you know, back and forth. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, I did see him set up his tent and I decided to, you're going to push on, you know, push on, um, and, uh, you know, set up my tent and I pushed on another hour and ended up about two miles in front of him. Um, I didn't really know this at the time, but, uh, you know, Jenna would relay me from time to time, you know, blogs or things written. And, you know, the next morning his blog, you know, it says the race is on. So he'd been calling home uh, and, uh, you know, reporting his status, you know, totally normal. New York times had been reporting on it and all this kind of stuff. And his blog was like, the race is on acknowledging that I had passed him and I was in front of him, but also being like, it's a long way to go. Right. Like we got a long long time out here. I'm not too worried about this kind of two mile gap that's opened up with, you know, 900 some miles still to go or whatever it was. Um, but on that point forwards, I decided to wake up early the following morning as well. Uh -huh. um, See, get out of my tent is. to get it. Exactly. That's the eye of the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> you so know, right? the extra hour. You're like, oh yeah, the up. race is on. Okay. Yeah. But it's, it, the thing is, is that what mostly got to me in that moment, the intensity of that moment was it was going to be really challenging to be with an eyesight of each other. I mean, first of all, the intention was to do this thing solo. So both of us wanted that anyways. We're just like the, mm -hmm. the, the nobility of this challenge was to be completely alone. And so we both recognized that. Um, and I think, you know, realized that for one another, but also it was just, I mean, if it was going to be, I mean, day six, we started doing it at seven, eight, nine, we start doing that for the next like three, four, five weeks, like back and forth, like you're a mile ahead. No, 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 I'm a mile ahead. Oh no, no, this thing happens. Yeah. Like it was going to like, I think it was going to wear us both down in a pretty insane way. So I, tried to get up early the next morning, stayed ahead and ultimately, you know, kept, kept my distance out front for the remainder of the time. Right, and that was it. So undeniably though, the fact that you two were doing it, you know, in tandem in this way, um, pushed both of you. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, not, not to say that you wouldn't have finished otherwise, but, uh, I doubt that it would have been 54 days. No, right? absolutely. Like it, it would have been a whole different ball game. No, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, both of us had planned to take longer. I think both of us, you know, and we've had, com him and I've had conversations with this afterwards. Um, both of us had, you know, thought that on the worst stormy days, like those really brutal days where you'd be like, okay, I'm going to stay in my tent. Granted, you're going to run out of food if you do that a bunch of times, but maybe I'm going to eat I'm going to take the gamble to eat less, but wait out this storm mm -hmm. or something like that. But and you had like a five or six day buffer on food, right? I did. I did. Um, you know, ultimately I had about 60 days worth of food. Um, but uh, it, you know, it, you start doing the math and you're going, okay, I can't really wait out that many more of these days. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, him and I have both said to one another, like, had it been this way, had it been that, we would have both, it probably would have done 60 or 65 days. Mm -hmm. Instead, I finished in 54. Um, and it was just really, you know, that pushed us, you know, I don't, I'm certainly no Roger Bannister, but to make the comparison between, you know, breaking the four minute mile, like, you know, people say this thing's impossible. Roger Bannister, you know, breaks the four minute mile. And I think it's incredible testament that within the next 12 months, you know, several other people break that mark. And so I think it is similar, which is this thing had been said, it's impossible, it's impossible, it's impossible. And there was something about two people out there pushing each other to a higher degree to ultimately finish this thing. And yeah, I finished in 54 days and I'm getting ahead of myself. We can backtrack, but you know, I got to the finish line and had that one pair of underwear on, desperately wanted to get out of there, wanted to eat some proper food, all these things. But I elected to not have the plane pick me up right away because I realized Lou's a couple days behind me. He's about to finish this extraordinary crossing. Like I want to be the first one there to congratulate him on yeah. a historic crossing as well. And that's where this, you know, like I said, that competitor inside of me and both of us trying to push ourselves to be the first Lou doing it in 56 days is extraordinary. I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's something that we both thought would take much longer. Um, and for us both to do it and him to come in just, you know, two, two and a half days behind me was amazing and certainly something he should be extraordinarily proud of. Yeah, it was super cool and gentlemanly for you to stay behind and, and wait for him to arrive. But it also would have been a dick move if you weren't there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like it, it, it kind of just, it wasn't even, you know, of course in the back of my mind, it's like, oh God, it'd be great to be out of here or whatever. But like to celebrate the entire, in the entirety of this thing mm -hmm. and our, our lives, like I said, you know, 7 billion people on the planet. And, you know, we've both done this one kind of rich, 
random niche thing, but yeah. we've both done this thing. And, you know, I didn't you know, want to be out in the world being like, yeah, I got him. I mean, because that's not how I feel. I mean, what he did was extraordinary. He honored his friend, Henry Worsley, in such an extraordinary way, you know, to bring that back to the UK. The first British person to do this after this long lineage of British explorers failing at doing this for him to be the successful one and to be the person that's done, like I said, more miles than anyone in Antarctica. I mean, he's a true legend. He's a national hero there as, as you know, as, as the veterans of all these wars. I mean, really, you know, extraordinary person. And I think it should be very proud. And it was great to just be able to, you know, honestly kind of learn from him and be out there with him and have the shared experience. And it was a really nice moment, honestly, when he did get to the finish that day. And, you know, he had set up his tent and we went and had yeah. like a 20 or 30 minute chat. Neither of us had a face to face chat with another human being, mm-hmm. and, you know, you know, however long. And to be able to just kind of, you know, before the, the media and all these things kind of got a hold of this project for us to just sit there and be like, wow, like, like soak it in. Amazing. Like that mm-hmm. was crazy. And talk about the hardships and you know he had some really you know challenging moments out there as well he got caught out in a whiteout and almost got separated from his sled i mean he had some really rough moments out there that he persevered through so yeah he um, had one moment where he decided to like leave some of his gear behind pull forward and then go back and get it yeah and it was buried in the snow exactly i guess that's something that he's done in the past when there's been some really tough conditions and we hit this really deep snow and him you know this is one of those those weird moments where i actually think my um naive the Tay um, helped me out. It's kind of like this Zen beginner's mind. Like I, the snow got deep and my sled got super heavy as a result. But I was like, I guess Antarctica is really hard. You know, like I didn't really know the difference. Whereas he had actually covered this section of the route on a previous expedition that he did with um, Six Skies. And so he is has a journal that he's comparing it off of and going like, wait, I was on this section before with this heavy of a sled moving this many miles. Like what's going on? And so I think he made the decision like, oh, this must just be like a couple of mile weird section with this like weird snow drift, I'm going to ferry my sled because it's too heavy, take mm. half of the weight out, ferry my sled ahead and go back. And he did that a couple of times successfully. And then all of a sudden the weather can change in Antarctica quick, really quickly. And he turns around to go back and his tracks have been blown over and he's separated from where his tent is and where his food supply is and all this kind of stuff. And I mean, gosh, even imagining that for me, like sends shivers down my spine. I can yeah, only imagine how scary that would have been. recovered it, it would have been game over. Yeah. And so he, you know, yeah. fortunately was able to find his sled. Um, and then and, you know, he have quickly put up his tent and kind of took a breather for the second half of that day, understandably so, because that happened to me actually one time when I got a little bit turned around and confused um, and I was tripping over some sastrugi, I actually was like, okay, the sastrugi is these big, huge kind of yeah, like- Yeah, we were getting to it. Yeah, yeah okay. go for it. Yeah, no, yeah, tell no. me. So, uh, you know, sastrugi, basically a lot of people picture Antarctica being this flat, blank, white landscape, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, first of all, the South Pole is at 9,310 feet. I started mm-hmm. at sea level, so I'm b- pulling this sled uphill all the way to the South Pole, which I arrived to on the 40th day. Um, but also these snow drifts, um, you know, Antarctica is the largest desert in the world. So it actually doesn't get- that much precipitation. Um, And so you've got these big um, kind of wind drifts, um, kind of almost like frozen waves of ocean, uh, you know, just sitting there. And so you're pulling your sled over thousands of speed bumps essentially per day. The Sastrugi, and when it's white out and Sastrugi, it's really hard to make progress because you can't see where your feet are. I was tripping and falling, you know, a number of times. And there was one time, you know, the second half of the project when I was pretty beaten down. I'd been in a long, you know, multi-day storm and I was tripping through the Sastrugi and I'm going like, wow, like maybe if I go a little bit east or a little bit west or where I am, I can find a path. Because sometimes it would be like really bad to struggle in an area, but then it would be a little bit less based on like right. where the winds were. And so I actually did unclip from my sled just for a second to kind of like go explore like a, maybe a quarter mile one direction or the other. And I take about 200 steps to the right um, of my sled. I remember this and I look back and I can't even see my sled anymore. And it's the same thing. Nothing is as, as intense as what Lou went through because I had only gone about 200 steps. So I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, okay, that's my lifeline. Yep, I need yeah. to like go and tie back in Ugh. immediately to that. So I pretty you much- imagine if yeah, you couldn't find it? It's just like, I mean, it's so disorienting out there. I mean, it's white on white on white on white. Um, and so it's just this, you know, it's only a momentary thing where I couldn't, I couldn't see it. And then like the wind blew and I could see it again. I was like, you know, your heart, you know, just covers, but you're going like, okay. Yeah, like You could be walking around for hours yeah. and it's right there and you can't, can't find, find it. it. Yeah. And so, um, but that's, you know, that's one differentiating factor between, you know, polar exploration and mountaineering. Mountaineering, you are typically separated from your tent and your supplies very commonly up on, you know, mountains because you can't carry everything with you. But in the polar environment, you've kind of always got your tent right mm-hmm. there unless you do something silly mm-hmm. and disconnect from your, your uh, sled, which, uh, you know, 
And the, I did in this case. The thing with the Sastrugi is you just can't get any momentum going. Right? Yeah. It's just constantly like, you know, hacking <laughs> it forward. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing with pulling a sled that heavy is the inertia, the initial sort of force to get it moving right. forwards, right? And when but it's moving, once you it's, can just cruise. You can, yeah. You can kind of glide. I mean, it's still a very slow, methodic process, but the most energy is basically taken from a stead stop to momentum. And so once you can carry a little momentum and get the skis going, it's still, like I said, very, very uh-huh. slow in, in the grand scheme of things, but you can get, you can get momentum going. But in Sastrugi, basically you're going up over these like two foot speed bumps. So your sled over and over again is like, you have to pull it up over the sled and then it crashes down up over the sled and crashes down up over the thing. It's crashed down. And just like, you can't get any rhythm. You can't get your feet to sort of step, be stable. Cause you've got skis on the bottom of your feet, which, you know, sometimes I say skis, people are like, Oh, so you were like downhill skiing. It's like, no, no, no. no. I was wearing skis yeah. basically as glorified snowshoes so that you, your weight is dispersed across the weight of the snow. And there's skins on the bottom of them that provide friction um, to allow you to basically pull against the mm-hmm. weight of that. So there's no, there's no skiing involved in this. It's uh, it's right. basically walking. Um, not even really like, you know, proper Nordic skiing. I mean, a little bit, but not even really. It's mostly just like this long trudge, but the skis give you a little bit more grip on the snow. And the elevation gain, man. Yeah, I mean, and I so mean, it's, it's it's literally like you're, it's, I mean, 9,000 feet of gain, right? Yes. Isn't, isn't the highest point like 10,200 yeah, or something? Yeah, there's somewhere like 10, or the highest, well, the highest mountain in Antarctica is Mount Vincent, which is 16,000 feet, mm-hmm. which I climbed on the Seven Summits Project, Explorers Grand Slam. But the, uh, the um the highest point up on the polar plateau is called the Titan Dome, and that's over ten thousand feet. Um, we kind of skirted around the edge of that, but actually from the South Pole still had to go up to about nine thousand eight hundred feet. So that was my highest point was roughly ninety eight hundred feet. And what's weird is that you know we think of altitude in terms of you know losing our breath at high altitudes, you know near the equator. Um, you know I, I'm not a scientist, so I might not get this perfectly right, but basically the atmospheric pressure is a little bit different at the North and right. South Poles, and so nine thousand feet actually feels more like twelve or 13,000 feet out here. So it's basically like pulling a 300 some pound sled uphill, you know, up in the, the high no Sierras oxygen. or, the, or the, the Rockies or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of days when I'd be shoveling snow, I'd have to shovel snow to like put it on the edge of my tent for wind blocks and things like that. I'd be like super, super out of breath um, and have to like sit there and catch my breath and uh, kind of, you know, catch my breath to be able to move forwards. What's the lowest moment? Was there a moment where you're like, I just, it's, I just can't keep going. Yeah, um, it, you know, it's so hard to pick one because there were many, mm-hmm. many, many dark moments. But um, you know, the one of the darkest moments for me, you know, after the South Pole, I arrived at the South Pole on day forty, and as you know, it's been a lot of ups and downs at that point. Um, I think I'm about, you know, maybe thirty miles ahead of Lou at this point, or about a day ahead of day, day and a half ahead of him. Um, but I'm just, you know, trying to find my rhythm. And that day, actually, for me, ended up being this beautiful day. So I get to the South Pole, and it's a weird place um, because there's actually a scientific research base there. Um, there's there's other scientists and things based out of there. So it's the one kind of like look at you know the human world, but I. I can't really touch it. If someone mm-hmm. really hands me a cup of coffee or a cookie, you know, it's there? unsupported. Um, there are people there um, and it's the middle of it. When I arrived, I'm on Chilean time, but they stay on uh, New Zealand time. The U.S. base does because they fly from Christchurch. And so it's this weird thing. Like it's 10 a.m. for me, but it's like 2 a.m. the following day for them. Even though, you're even in though the we're in the, literally place. the same location, <laughs> um, which is just like a bizarre Depending thing. Depending upon which part of the planet you would like drive up on. Yeah. You know? um, so a couple scientists actually did walk out of the base and uh you know they had been following along and kind of waved and took a couple pictures um but of course they they can't give me anything or anything like that but i knew that um you know and that's that's understood in the polar community that that, like you know you don't have a lot of control over that but if you take any support from them that's a whole different thing and so not wanting to be not that i would be tempted but not just to be in this environment for very long i planned to only be there for 30 minutes so i arrived took a couple pictures in front of the south pole sign and continued on um and it was this beautiful sunny day actually this kind of calm day where i you know, had these just tears of joy rolling down my face. It was a, actually one of my best moments. It was kind of like, oh, like I made it. Only 23 people I think have ever done solo unsupported and unassisted from the coast to the South Pole, 23, 24 mm-hmm. in history. And so just doing that was like an amazing accomplishment. And all, um, the, all the elevation gain is in your rear view then, right? Right, and so you're, you're up on the plateau, so it's not like immediately going downhill, but yeah, you're like on the other side of this thing. Now you're going to hopefully be descending somewhere. It's like, it's a big milestone. And uh-huh. the second half, the, the way that the route was, it's actually a further distance on the front half of 
about 600 and yeah. some miles to get to the pole, but only 300 and some to get to the other ice shelf on the other side. And so like, it's a big moment for me. And I'm like, oh, I've kind of, you know, I'm feeling good about this. And then the next day I just get lit up in this storm and the next seven or eight days, like the, the storms had lasted previous to this about one or two days. And then all of a sudden this storm got seven, you know, six days, seven mm-hmm. days, eight days. I find myself, um, you know, kind of picking through this Sestrugi, you know, day 48, eight days in this battle with this storm. The wind hasn't been anything lower than 40, 50 mile per hour. It's just brutal conditions. Um, and I find myself falling like really bad. So I actually fall on the ground, hit the ground super hard. And I remember this one moment I fall into this big hole and my rope on my harness pulls tight and then my sled starts sliding towards me. And I'm in this kind of four foot hole and I see this sled like kind of like maybe kind of fall down on top of me. It's like, I'm looking where my leg is, but like, I can't move it because the skis are on the ground i'm like wow like and it's like teetering it's like this sled falls on me it's like broken leg broken ski in a sastrugi Mm -hmm. storm and then i look down and my skins have ripped off the bottom of one of my skis which is impossibly hard to get back Mm -hmm. on in this storm and i've only gone for one hour and so i'm like okay, the only way to get my skins back on is to set up my tent. So I think to myself, okay, like I should set up my tent right now and then like maybe regroup, but I like can't just waste the day because I am starting to run or lower on food and certainly, you yeah. know, trying to stay in the front uh, of this race. And so I set up my tent and there's this video clip of me where I did, you know, I, I filmed a lot of this stuff. My Obviously I filmed it all myself, um, but I filmed a lot through the time and I'm looking in the camera and I'm just going like, I'm sobbing and I'm like, I'm not doing good. Like, I just want to give up. Like, I'm like so beat down in this. And it was just kind of in this moment, you know, two things for me happened in that moment to get out of that headspace, which is another one of my favorite mantras. It's the simple one that a lot of us have, which is this too shall pass, you know, remembering sort of the impermanence of this moment. But also um, I had this satellite device that I was pinging to the satellites every 10 minutes that people could track me in real time. That's how the New York Times and family and friends and all these school kids through a nonprofit were following along. And, uh, you know, they see that I've stopped. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Blake Brinker, he, he he saw that I stopped and was like, wow, something must not be going like well for you. Like and was checking in. And you could send these like rudimentary text messages to the satellite device. Um, and he sent a text message and it's a passage from one of my favorite books, which is The Alchemist. Um, and he says, uh, he says, remember the allegory from The Alchemist that you're being tested by all the lessons you have to go through before finally achieving the ultimate success. And he goes, don't forget when passing, you know, The Alchemist, of course, is about the desert but in order because it's own kind of desert. Um, and he says, more often than not, people die of thirst when crossing the desert a few minutes before seeing the palm trees on the horizon. And so it was just this reminder of like, yo, like you're in it. Like mm-hmm. you are getting tested right now. But if right. you can manage to get back out of this tent, out of this tent, remember that this too shall pass, then you will hopefully get to the other side of this. And sure enough, on that day, it was tough. But, you know, just taking my tent up and down in the storm takes an hour, hour and a half. And I, so I do that. But instead of getting my sleeping bag out, I take my tent down again, fix my skins and get back out and battle through this storm and manage 20 miles that day, which was a pretty solid mileage for me on any given day. Um, And I think to me, that was both the lowest moment, but also a crux moment where I'm being tested by all of these things. And it would have been, there was a million reasons to quit in that moment, at least maybe not quit the whole project, but quit in that moment. Be like, I'm falling. I'm going to get hurt. My sled's going to fall on me. My skins are falling off. The storm's lasted a week. Like I'm starting to get frostbite on my nose and my cheeks. Like I'm beat up. And I still managed to, you know, with the strength of sort of others and that vibration from family and friends and supporters is able to kind of draw some strength and inspiration to keep going. That's incredible, man. Um, How many days, I think it was like halfway, you were about halfway in when uh, during your evening call with Jen, she's like, I need you to be around this between this time and this time uh, to make sure to answer the phone. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yes. yes. Um, It was hilarious. Uh, I I see where you're going with this. The, uh, this is one of my favorite stories for this whole adventure. Um, So about, so I actually um, spent most of the time in silence. I actually mm-hmm. brought very little with me um, via, you know, me at media on my phone and stuff because I actually was really curious about these flow states and kind of exploring that in my mind and didn't want to have kind of this crutch of listening to a bunch of music or podcasts. However, side note to the tangent of the story, I did listen to the Rich Roll podcast quite did, a few man. times out there. <laughs> it was actually one of the few podcasts that I had with yeah. me. And there was one moment, uh, and I'll get back to the other story in a second, but there was one moment in particular um, that was so apropos, which was your interview with um, Desiree right after she won the Boston mm-hmm. Marathon. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, she, you know, she, her whole thing is keep showing up. 
And that was kind of her mantra. And it was like, I was just at the right time that I heard that. Like, first of all, like your energy on this podcast is so just resonant and positive and beautiful. Um, and I just couldn't allow any kind of even kind of negative voices in my head. So your voice to me, this is a weird to say to you in front of you. It's like, it's so soothing and calming. Funny, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, and so that was amazing. But that conversation you had with her in particular, it was this moment where I was hitting that deep snow and like, was like, why am I going so much slower? And why is this? And I hear her whole story about persevering and right. ultimately winning the Boston Marathon her whatever 12th year of being a professional. And she's like, just keep showing up, just keep showing up. And so that, that really hit me. Um, but about around about this similar time, and I had been a lot of times in silence, um, but uh, your podcast was uplifting and I also needed a, just like a, just an uplifting moment. So I put up one, one album that I brought with me was Paul Simon's Graceland. And uh, I cranked that up on the 16th day. I played it start to finish uh, about, you know, six or seven times. And it's one just of those like albums, looping it, just looping, looping it. it. Uh-huh. And it's one of those albums, you know, my parents played it a ton when I was a kid. I think it came out in the early nineties. So I was, you know, maybe seven, eight years old when that came out. And it's just an album that I just absolutely love, like the drumming and the collaboration, it's just a beautiful album. And and so I have this like solo dance party by myself on the 17th day, just bumping Paul Simon's Graceland. And my evening post on Instagram that night was like, tough day for me out here in the deep snow. You know, I've been in the silence for a long time, but decided to just listen to something. And I put that out there, just like, no big deal. Mm-hmm. And so day 35, a couple of weeks later, as you mentioned, Jenna says to me, and I'm in a, getting pretty tired. I'm up on the polar plateau. I'm about five days out from the South Pole, trying to stay really focused on that, you know, getting to that waypoint. And uh, she says, hey, you know, I know you're exhausted. I know it's been a long day. You've already done all the, your steps. And this is usually, we'd get on the phone and I would go to sleep. And she goes, I need you to call this one other number. And I'm like, like, what? Like, why? And she's like, I'm, she's like, just trust me, like call the number. And I'm like, well, and she's like, just do it. You know, I'm like, fine. And so I'm thinking it's like a reporter or I'm not really sure what it is. And I call this number and this voice answers this guy answers the phone. He's like, I'm like, hi, uh, this is Colin from Antarctica. And he's like, oh, hello. (laughs) Hi, this is Paul. And I'm like, Paul. And he's like, yeah, Paul Simon. And I was like, wait, what? And it's like 35 days in, uh-huh. I haven't talked to anyone. I'm like, am I hallucinating? Like, am I actually sitting in the middle of Antarctica on my satellite phone talking right. to Paul Simon? Like, have I completely lost my mind? Um, but sure enough, it was him. And it was, uh, you know, of course, I was just like, you know, it's kind of stunned and shocked by this conversation. My, you know, you know, probably social skills are pretty limited given how much solitude I've been in. But we are start having this conversation. You know, he asked me about Antarctica, some of the, ba- you know, how cold is it? The basic questions you might ask. And then- we end up having this conversation, which is like stuck with me in such a deep way. Um, as I had kind of, like I said, started to explore this idea of being an artist more so than an athlete. And just like I said, this sort of mm-hmm. canvas being the endurance sports. And so we end up having this conversation about like his album Graceland and how he created it and how he went to South Africa during apartheid, which was really controversial, but to get these beautiful drum tracks from these local tribes and the process of this creation that ultimately for him was his art piece of this beautiful masterpiece album album that has inspired millions of people through dance and play and love and laughter mm-hmm. and all these things. And we ended up talking for, you know, 30 or 40 minutes, a very expensive satellite phone call yeah. from the bottom of the world. But it was just like, it hit me at just the right time um, to just kind of keep me going and really connect me back to this larger purpose, which was, yes, I was doing this. Yes, I wanted to be the first person as a competitive athlete and, you know, the curiosity about challenging my body. But really the larger purpose of this entire project was to put something into the world that people would say like, wow, like I am paying. I face impossible goals in my life. I face challenges. I face obstacles. And yes, I might not want to walk across Antarctica, but we all have our equivalent of an Antarctica or an impossible challenge or an audacious goal. And we also have a million reasons not to do this. I can't, I don't, I want, I, you know, you know, all these doubts and these. And so for me to put this out in the world in this way and connecting with Paul on this sort of idea of creation and art and this positivity resonating from that, it was just amazing to have that conversation and also just wildly surreal (laughs) to be chatting with Paul in the middle of Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> so obviously somebody saw that post or he saw it or it got to him. Yeah, and he, apparently. And he reached out, Jen, somehow the wires got connected. Yeah, to, yeah. So Jen, yeah, they reached out and said, you know, said hey, Paul saw that calling him and listening to his album. Mm-hmm. Is there any way to connect with him and whatnot? And they connected the dots. And so Jenna knew who I was calling, of course, when she gave me that phone number. That's why she was like, trust me. Like, and I trust yeah. Jenna. It's like, it's like, she wouldn't normally, like she knows how exhausted and, you know, she kept me pretty protected. I mean, I was talking to her and then, you know, checked in with Adam Skolnick, New York Times a couple of times. It's not like I was, you know, talking 
talking to pretty much anybody. Right. You're just um, on the phone I'm, all day. Yeah, no, I'm like, <laughs> that's yeah, not yeah, what was yeah. happening. And even the conversations with her, although very uplifting at times, were like very like business. Like, okay, like how much food did you eat today? How much water? How like mm-hmm. you know? How are your supplies? How's this? You know, just like kind of safety checks more than anything. Um, and of course, there's an emotional booth to be able to talk to my incredible wife during that time. Yeah, and she's um, the unsung hero in all of this. I mean, yes. you're, you're always going out of your way to make sure that she gets the credit that that you know that's due her, but. You know, the more I kind of dive into this and and learn about you know how this whole thing went down, I mean, she's running the running the tight ship. Yeah, and you know, you say unsung. Hopefully, I, I try to uh, sing the yeah. praises as much as possible. And again, that's not just uh, you know a shout out from a, a loving husband to an amazing wife, but as somebody who is really the the backbone of this entire operation, from the strategy around how to build it, the logistics, the the media and social media strategy, the nonprofit with the kids. I mean, she is a incredibly savvy businesswoman. This artwork, this creativity that we put into the world does not exist without a tremendous hard work from her. But then, you know, she's balancing that with like the emotions of a loving wife who's right. of course worried about their spouse and this challenging conditions. And so she somehow has this incredible way of being able to balance both this strength of this, you know, this savvy businesswoman about the love and compassion towards me as well as not holding me back and encouraging and pushing me mm-hmm. when I need it. You know, one of my, you know, we've, we've gone through many, you know, fortunately we met, you know, 12 years ago, met relatively young and have gone through, you know, very kind of waves of life together. And it's amazing to be able to do this collaboration full-time together, you know, for years and years. But, you know, there's moments where, you know, she's known how to push me. I think I probably told this story once on your podcast before, but, you know, being up on the summit of Everest and coming back down and I've, you know, I've got Denali left to set the Explorers Grand Slam world record. And I call her from camp four in the death zone. I'm exhausted. And I'm like, Jenna, I'm exhausted. You know, I, uh, you know, summit at Everest, you know, if we can get up to Nolly in the next two months, I'm going to set this record. So give me a couple of days to rest, whatever. And she goes, she says to me, she goes, actually, um, I need you to put your boots back on right now. And I'm like, excuse me? She's like, yeah, we've been doing some calculating. It just so happens if you can get off Everest right now, get in a helicopter, fly to Kathmandu, fly all the way to An- or Alaska and climb Denali, not in three weeks, but in three days, you can set not one, but two world records, uh-huh. like ready, go. So it's like, I-, I say that story to illuminate, you know, she's not only, she's like, Heck yeah, celebrating the accomplishments, running all these things in the background. But she's also like, yeah, you're at Camp Four on Everest. Like, put those right. boots back on. Like, get down that right, mountain. Right, like, right, right. we got stuff to keep doing. So, I mean, it's just, it's just this amazing partnership. I feel so, so, so blessed. And this is, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's. If anything, it's fifty fifty us. If more so, sometimes I feel like I've got the easy job, which is the linear task of actually doing the physical demands of this. And she's you juggling, have like you know, one thing that you need. To exactly, do she's juggling a hundred balls in right. orbit and keeping them all in the air as well as keeping me safe and alive and healthy and well mentally and physically so you know jenna Jenna is just such an extraordinary person i'm so blessed that's the only way this all happens well one of the amazing things about this expedition was that everybody could share it online because every day you would upload a photo and a post um kind of chronicling this in real time which was insane like that's one of the insanely cool things about social media yeah you know there's a lot of problems (laughs) with it but like (laughs) It was amazing to like every day, like, okay, where's Colin? How's he doing? Where is he? And you would like have these photos. So I have so many questions. I'm like, first of all, like, how does this even work? Like he's, how is he even taking pictures? And then how are those pictures getting from where he is to ending up on Instagram? Like, how is he writing these posts? Like, what is the backstory there? Yeah, so, you know, Jenna and I really made this commitment to share these stories in real time. You know, as much as I admire the the polar explorers or the explorers of decades or centuries ago, um, and sort of the purity of that, of going off into this great unknown um, for several years at times sometimes mm-hmm. and coming back and sharing this story, we, of course, live in this world where the technology exists um, with some some crazy loopholes to do it in Antarctica, but where you can share these stories in real time. And I think the real, like I said, the passion for me is this resonance of positivity with other people. You know, I'm not so interested in being the athlete in the arena of people watching me like, oh, good job, you set another world record. But it's more so like, whoa, like I get these tons of messages now that just like, you know, mean the world to me where people write to me on Instagram. They go like, I heard your story and I'm a single mother, you know, dealing with this hard thing in my life. Like, thank you for encouraging me 
me to keep putting one foot in front of the other in my life or that. And so we really have this commitment to sharing these stories in real time as much as possible. We started that a couple of years ago. I was actually the first person in history to Snapchat from the summit of Mount Everest uh, uh-huh. back in 2016. Um, you know, you know, some fun things we've done there, but that, you know, the how and why, you know, that's the why the how is, you know, we, I carry this little satellite modem with me. Um, you know, like I said, no extra pair of underwear, but we committed to, you know, carrying the weight for this and it's solar um, powered. So in, in Antarctica, you've got 24 hours of daylight. And so one of the benefits of that, mm. of course, is I have these small solar panels that can charge yeah. electronics. Um, but it's not really that straightforward and simple. It's not like I'm like browsing Instagram or I have like a proper internet connection. It takes me about sometimes an hour, between 30 minutes and an hour to upload one single image to Jenna's inbox in like relatively low res. And then she reposts it. But all the words, everything I wrote were mine. And so at the end of every single day, there were times when I didn't necessarily want to, you know, I was just like exhausted with all the things I was doing. I just wanted to go to sleep. But I had made this commitment to really share this story. And I knew that there were, you know, 30,000 school kids on six mm-hmm. continents Following along and tuning on, you know, several, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, I guess, ultimately millions of people tuning in and following this thing, which was, you know, incredibly humbling to realize. And I just been committed to sharing it like exactly how it was happening. Like the good days were great. The, the tough days were tough. The things going on in my mind, the doubts, the fears, the ups and downs. And so I would just sit down and it was actually in the end, a beautiful process of a moment to reflect on the end of each day and kind of put it mm-hmm. to words. And it's nice, you know, I've been an avid journaler throughout my life, but it's nice to be able to look back on those posts and being like, oh, like this is how I was feeling. But the photos, it's hilarious. If you were following my Instagram feed during this time, almost every day, I didn't, of course, I didn't know this because yeah. I couldn't see the comments. I couldn't see Instagram. Um, you know, I was just, po- I would write a text email and send this via the satellite. And I no, like it. I would leave comments thinking like, well, maybe he does have a an iPhone that connects and he can actually be on this platform. Yeah. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but from time to time, yeah. you know, you know, Jenna would send me like, oh, you know, actually she told me you had commented yeah. a couple of times, which was super cool. And and various folks she'd pass some comments on. But no, I, I can't open Instagram. Right. Like I can't yeah, open yeah, any of these things. Okay. But um uh, you know, she's taking the image and taking the text right. that I write in this email and, and post putting them together. But it was funny. Um, she was like, she was like, literally every single day, like ten people comment, like, "Well, you're not really alone because you've got this camera crew right. out there, obviously yeah. taking these photos of yeah. you." Um, and, and so it's hilarious because, of course, that is not the case. I took all the photos of myself. Um, Did and you just have a GoPro, or what were you doing? Yeah. So what's really tough when it's that cold is that cameras they, they the battery work. dies yeah. like in like thirty seconds. Um, and also, if you take your gloves off and you have like bare hands on like electronics, like your fingers can get frostbit like mm-hmm. pretty quickly. Um, and so it was challenging to take all those images. The, it's funny now to watch back some of the video footage because, you know, we've cut it into some beautiful pieces of me like walking off into the distance in Antarctica, whatever. But of course the video continues and I turn around and come all the way back to the camera and pick it back uh-huh. up. It's not as glamorous. But yeah, the one thing that worked really well um, for me to get a lot of those shots, a lot of them are stills. I mean, I could, on, I could only share stills from Antarctica. I mm-hmm. certainly couldn't send video files. Um, but, uh, the videos we've now, you know, uploaded now. Um, but I use a GoPro mostly, um, and I would let it run and then I would able to be like, take a single frame, uh, frame sort of screenshot, like a screenshot of, of a video, of a video. Right. Exactly. And right. so that worked the best because it was really, I mean, it was almost impossible to capture like motion. Set it up and like, like walk by. Yeah. And, and I had a little right. tripod with me. I'd like yeah. set it up and walk by uh-huh. and be like, Oh, like that one frame is or I'm setting up my tent and I want to like show that, or I want to like show this crazy storm or this, you know, I did my best, you know, with what doing I had it for the gram. Yeah. I did, did the it, whole thing, doing the, the whole thing for the gram. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. exactly. That was the entire purpose. Uh, no, not at all, but That's it was hilarious. a fun, it was amazing. Like you said, I think that I, I have the same feeling about social media which is there's a lot of things wrong with it and we mm-hmm. think are all guilty at times of being sucked into that world and I, I try to not um, get my brain too uh, foggy with that but it's also incredible to be able to actually like in real time share this journey and what was amazing for me and I didn't really realize at the time again Jenna was kept me in a pretty productive bubble which was necessary to the high performance element of this um, but the amount of people that started following along the amount of people that were interested the amount of people commenting the amount of people you know again sending these mm-hmm. messages of positivity about their own lives overcoming their obstacles, fears they're going through, um, it definitely became um, something that I'm proud of in that way. And it, it's weird to say, although I think maybe on your podcast is one place where I don't sound like a weirdo saying this, but I really started to feel this just resonant positivity back you know, from the universe um, from this, of me kind of putting this out into the world. But all of a sudden, like I said, you know, there was moments when you know either Jenna or a close friend or something would send me something. But more than anything, as this kind of built and the energy around this built, I felt like not alone. I felt mm-hmm. like there was just this like groundswell of positive energy, revive 
vibrating in sort of, you know, both directions. Um, and I was very viscerally connected to that. And that was a beautiful thing. And I don't know if that's from, you know, not specifically from Instagram or whatnot, but from the amount of people, you know, like, you know, cheering me on, saying encouraged things, as well as kind of having that go in a two-way direction of me, hopefully encouraging others. Well, that low-grade aerobic output matched with solitude and then being in a place where there's no humans around for as far as you can see and zero distractions. If that's not going to contribute to A, some level of flow state and B, some kind of uh, self-reflection and, you know, spiritual awakening that yeah. I don't know what's going to do it. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was beautiful. I mean, you no know, meditation is something that's been a big part of my life for several years. I think in 2011 was the first time I did a 10 day Vipassana, you know, 10 days silent, no reading. Have you done one of those before? Not yet, Not but yet. like, it seems like every single guest I have Dude. on the podcast, I was just up at Jack Dorsey's house uh-huh. He's telling me about his latest 10 day yeah. Vipassana retreat. Game changer. So Game I think I'm going to highly recommend, you know, that, you know, people ask me like, I'm never going to go to Antarctica. I'm never this. I'm like, if you want to do something that has like profound and deep impact, mm. 10 day Vipassana, I mean, it's, it's free to go. Um, it's just a commitment of your body and spirit and mind. And it's, um, really, really beautiful. And I've done that several times. Um, that certainly helped prepare me for the solitude in some, some regard, but this 54 days was just like the next, like the deepest, deepest the layer ultra of, of the ultra Vipassana. <laughs> um, and it was incredible. I mean, it was incredible to feel that it was incredible to actually feel not alone, uh, most of the time. Um, and, and it did connect me to, you know, whatever you want to call that the universe, the vibration of the planet. I definitely felt really connected in that way. And that was really profound, but also, you know, I wrote down, you know, four or five, you know, lessons right when I got back, I've always been able to unpack more of this now but you know top of mind when i finished was really about like love this word this this repetition of infinite love infinite love infinite love and this ability that we i think we all have as humans to love infinitely to love to love our neighbors to love our family and friends but really to actually put that positivity and the resonance of love into the universe and how much that can reflect back when we do so you know that was really clear to me in this moment and all these sort of lessons about of course this deep connection with jenna and this sort of emotional journey that we were able to go on together was beautiful but also connected me back to you know, family and friends and memories that I had lost from the past that kind of came up in these beautiful moments of childhood with my sister or my mother or kind of reliving these moments that kind of connected me back. Um, you know, not that I'm disconnected from my family, but on a deeper level of, you know, family and friendship. And really kind of the essence of all of this was how much as humans, of course, I'm all alone and this is what I'm, you know, pontificating about, but I'm thinking about the importance of community, the importance that we all have to lean in, to love one another, to really be compassionate, to help, to uplift and support one another and how much stronger we can be when there's that, you know, not this finite level of love, but this infinite love that we can share with one another and what that can really create in this universe was was absolutely spectacular to feel that and be so viscerally mm-hmm. connected to that at the end of this journey. And what has it taught you about not only your own capabilities, but about human capabilities in general and, and, and potential. You know, I feel like I scratched the surface of this, you know, 11 years ago. Um, and we've talked about this before, but when I was severely burned in this fire in Thailand, I was told I would never walk normally. And then I recovered from that, um, through the guidance of my mother's love and positivity ultimately. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to interrupt you really yeah. quickly here just to share one reflection on that. We have talked about that, and I'm well aware of that story from your life, but this is how weird memory works. In my mind, I had this sense that that had happened way earlier in your life than it actually had. And when I sort of realized like, oh wait, that was 2008. Like that wasn't that long ago, yeah. dude. That was only 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, was, I had been a collegiate swimmer before that. I mean, kind of gone through a big chapter of my life and um, yeah, I was, uh, you know, took a surfboard and a backpack and scraped together some pennies after college to go travel the world. And I met Jenna at the very beginning of that trip. So that was a, a net positive for that who mm-hmm. ultimately became, of course, this most important person in my life. Um, but not long after that, I found myself in rural Thailand with a kerosene flaming rope wrapped around my legs, my body lit on fire and um, having to dive into the ocean to extinguish the flames to save my life, but not before my legs were severely burnt and spent several months in the Thai hospital being told I would never walk again normally. And in, in that moment, 
my mother came, she arrived about the fourth or fifth day and kind of comes to my bedside. And she says like, Colin, like visualize your future, like visualize yourself, you know, being whatever you want to be, you know, your life's not over. And I was just in this deep, tragic, you know, place in my mind and my body and my spirit. Um, and I closed my eyes kind of trying to, you know, placate my mother in some regard. And I pictured myself crossing the line of a, of a triathlon, which is mm-hmm. not something I'd ever done. And so I won't right. get into the whole story, but the, you know, the next 18 months were kind of learning from that lesson and keeping this sort of fixed goal my mind of racing this triathlon and ultimately, you know, competing in the Chicago triathlon as an amateur and winning my first, you know, ever triathlon and my first go at it, right. um, which this was crazy. a crazy moment. But the reason I bring that story up, I mean, it's important inflection point in my life, which is, you know, in that moment, I started to feel, I wasn't like, wow, like I'm so amazing. Like I, that I'm so blessed and so good at this. I was like, wow, like as humans, I believe we all have these reservoirs of untapped potential inside of us and can achieve these extraordinary things when we shift our mindset for the positive, when we're supported by this loving community of infinite love and compassion and positivity, like, wow, like how extraordinary is that? And so that was my first kind of lesson towards that. But I was, you know, 22, 23 mm-hmm. years old and I'm kind of the beginning of this journey, which has been the last, you know, decade of my life in this chapter. In Antarctica, um, certainly not the last chapter of my life, but the most recent chapter of my life is Antarctica. And to connect to that on such an even, even, you know, 10x or 100x deeper level, which is like, wow, like, what, like, look at what we are capable of myself. I mean, people keep coming back. You know, I do these interviews and things and people want to say like, Colin, like, are you superhuman? And I'm like, yeah, I'm superhuman. And so are you. Like, so are all of us, but it just, I think it just happens how we flex this muscle between our ears, the six inches between our ears, like what we can do with our minds is extraordinary and how we can all be connected and uplifting of each other in that sense. And so for me in Antarctica, the lessons learned were yes, about my own potential, but really were resonant, you know, across humanity of what we are all capable when we set our minds to things. And I, again, I don't think that necessarily anyone wants to walk across Antarctica so <laughs> unsupported and unaided. I don't yeah. blame you for not wanting to do that, but like we have dreams, we have goals and it's so easy to get in our own ways of stopping the progress towards that. And like when I started this whole thing, like, like I said, you know, Jen and I had like no money. We had like a whiteboard on our wall, every reason not to do this. And like, it should be like, yeah, like go get a real job, like grow up, like yeah. do something. We're like, no, like what can we do to have positive impact? Let's start a nonprofit. Like let's dare to dream greatly. And like, we started out by like taking out our Mac laptops and be like, well, if we want people to, on social media to do this. We better know about marketing. I had like 200 Instagram followers, like my parents and my close friends. Uh-huh. And we're Googling like, Google, what's the difference between marketing and PR? Like we're basic of all basic questions, you know, but I just got the metrics back on this last project. And we did, you know, as of now, it's 1.8 billion media impressions mm-hmm. and counting. And I don't say that because like I care about having like my name in like the press. But because of that, we've created this platform, this ability to share these stories about inspiration, positivity, love, um, nutrition, health, all the things that I'm passionate about. And I know from you, from having this podcast, it's also a blessing for you to be able to, you know, have this voice, not because like you want to be rich roll, this like famous guy, but because you have this opportunity to share with the world and the resonant positivity that you can put in the world from that is incredibly humbling and meaningful. And I yeah. applaud you for it. I mean, you know, lasting impact, that's the juice, right? So what is the what is the lasting impact that that you know what is the impact that you want this adventure and everything that you're doing going forward to have like what is the change that you want to see in the world yeah you know i think that um when I've really tried to drill down to this, I, you know, I mentioned this before, like sort of this athlete in arena and I'm, I'm, a, by the way, I'm a massive sports fan. Like I'm, you know, I, I like watching sports as throughout my life. Um, but I think that our sort of knowledge or interest in sports in general, not always the case. I think like the NBC Olympic coverage is a great example yeah. of not doing this, but oftentimes the sports are like winning, losing, like this sort of like the zero sum game of like cheering for your team or rooting against the enemy or something like that. But, you know, for me in doing this, it's not so much about that at all. It's about tapping into these sort of universal truths that we all face and encounter, which is like facing obstacles, stepping outside of our comfort zone to grow um, and being an example of those lessons and showing, you know, showing all the flaws. Like I'm not sitting here going like, yep, I stepped off the plane. I knew I could beat Lou. He was not, you know, it's like, no, Mm -hmm. like I like had this huge daunting task of crossing Antarctica. Oh, and by the way, like the most experienced polar explorer in the world, it's also out there beside me. But I was willing to like give it a shot, which is I think emblematic of someone starting a small business, everyone going like, oh, but like, 
why wouldn't Google or Facebook just like do the same thing? Why would you start with that tech idea? Like that's never going to work. Or, you know, the person that's like starting a family or has lost a loved one and like just figuring out how to get on through life. And so hopefully like by sharing my story as authentically and really as I can with all the ups and downs and the struggles and the warts and the successes that people can take from that in their own lives, what they will and really paint their own masterpieces. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, man. (laughs) And you're you're working on a book. I am. I yeah. am working on a book. That's really exciting. Um, you know, that's uh, of course uh, fun to be able to you know be offered that platform to be able mm-hmm. to do that. I know you you've sat and uh, done that yourself. So I'm uh, cutting my teeth on my first book, but uh, you know, hoping to have that out within the next year or so. But um, it's been really excited to begin to dive into that process. And really, it's a fun process for me. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to share the story. I am. You know, I do a lot of you know public speaking and things like that. But um, to be able to sit and that's one of the reasons I love doing podcast interviews because it's like one thing like, you know, you've been on these short TV segments before and it's mm-hmm. like three minutes, like say your thing real quick. Like I'm Rich Roll, mm-hmm. I, you know, you know, vegan triathlete, you know, like whatever it is. It's like Antarctica. Yeah. Was it cold? Yeah. yeah. So it's like this like weird thing. And why I love podcasting, of yeah. course, is the, you know, I love storytelling and the ability to, you know, go deep and get real. And um, it seems like at least I'm, I'm still kind of in the early stages of this process, but it's forcing me to like get real about a longer form story. I mean, of course, it's, I'm probably not going to write a thousand page book, but even 300 mm-hmm. pages or whatever gives you the opportunity to really, you know, dive into different moments of times and, and illuminate different, you know, things. And it's been really, I think, nice um, with Antarctica, with this project specifically. Of course, I think the the book will it's going to be a memoir, mostly with you know it's going to cover Antarctica, of course, but it's also going to talk about other elements of my life and things. And you know, it gives me a sense to really reflect on the stories, and even the ones that don't necessarily make it into the book. Let's say it's amazing to go back through my journals from being a young yeah. kid and, and seeing sort of these pivotal moments, or maybe moments that I forgot, or um, you know, really kind of go back through Antarctica day by day, because in some senses, when we when we turn the page uh, on our life, so often it's easy to be like, oh yeah, yeah, sure, I did that. You know, for you, like, yeah. oh yeah, I raced Ultraman, and you know, that was in whatever. Well, when year. you go back like, and you read those journals, or you're going up on stage and you're sharing your story, your story starts to tell you what it is. Yes, and there's a there's an aspect of of self discovery and self exploration with that that I think leads to personal growth if done right. A hundred percent. And I think that it's I mean it's fun for me. I've been back, you know, from Antarctica for two months and uh, you know I, sitting down with you is always amazing because I feel like I should like owe you money at the end of this because it's like this cathartic like, <laughs> yeah. uh, therapy session. Yeah, but, but you're you know, giving you like five speeches a week yeah. now. I'm like, <laughs> like he's going to tell the story again. Uh. You know, you're all animated <laughs> and lit up. So, I, you know, like, but I'm wondering like, is it, you know, you, it's that thing where it's like, if you're doing it too much, like when does it start to become rote and not- yes not coming from that hard place. And I know? think what's what's beautiful about at least the moment I'm in, I can't, you know, I can't project forward 10 years or something like that, but at least like right in this moment is like, I'm still learning things. Like I'm humbled that people want me on stages right now and I'm sharing this story and I, I share it as well as I possibly can. And I think that there's some great, you know, great nuggets and take homes and all those things. It's a great story uh, in that sense, but I'm still learning from it. Like I'm still mm-hmm. unpacking the lessons from that. And I think that that's a amazing thing to have a genuine curiosity about where you've come to also dictate where you're going and to really sit in that moment of reflection. I mentioned you know, briefly before about this idea of memories, but you know, I'd long since thought that certain memories of mine were gone from childhood or things like that. But when I had the time to sit still in Antarctica, I mean, not physically sit still, but the stillness in my mind, you know, I found found this incredible, you know, ability to go back and catalog these memories, not like of epic things that happened to me, but also some of the like the mundane moments of, you know, uh-huh. driving to school as a kid with my sister or things like that, what we were singing and listening to on the radio, my first swim race ever. And not like, oh yeah, I was my first swim race ever was when I was five years old. It's like, I'm diving into the pool and I can see my mother on the other side and the wind's blowing and she's wearing an orange shirt. And I'm, you know, like the whole thing is playing out in this rich and vivid detail. And so it's exciting for me to be going back and reflecting on my life, not knowing like, gosh, I need to like remind myself of what happened, but go like, actually like it's in there. Like I'm a product of all of these things that happen. We all are a product of these memories, whether we can recall them quickly in our social media and instant gratification type of world that we live in, it's a little bit harder. But when you take that stillness and that pause, and that's why these Vipassana meditations have been beautiful for me as well as these moments of really deep reflection to, you know, reflect on mistakes I've made and, you know, things that I want to change going forward and ultimately grow. Yeah. What do you, is there anything that, uh, that like the media is getting wrong or where you feel like you've been misunderstood in this whole journey? Um, you know, not really. Um, 
I think uh, actually, uh, you know, Lewis House and I were talking about this last week, and I, I love what he says. I'm not going to get his perfect quote right. He's like a pretty articulate guy, but mm-hmm. something along the lines of like he goes like. Do you ever write a negative review like on like Yelp or something like that? And I'm like, no, like why would I ever do that? Uh-huh. And just kind of this idea that like no matter what you do, there's going to be like that one percent of like, well, why would you do this? Or you know, people will say like, oh, it must have been easy for you because you must have like so much money. And I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I actually grew up like quite poor. Or like you know, like oh, but like you have this like Ivy League education. It's like because I worked really hard as a swimmer when I was a kid and was like offered an opportunity to have a great education, but like based on like hard work, not from some like pedigreed like background, you know, it's like there's certain things that can people can pull. Um, But, you know, when people, you know, kind of reflect that way, I try to just reflect back like the positivity and just like, hey, like this is my story. Like I'm out here doing my very best and, you know, hoping to move forward to that. So there's like little tiny things like that. Well, there's always going to be grousing. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit. I mean, there's some, there's a little controversy over Borja. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, So he's the guy who in 1996, um, traversed Antarctica. He actually went quite a bit further on a totally yeah. different route, but there was some wind dated with a sail or something like that. So there's there's certain people out there who are, you know, basically like, well, Borge did it first. Right, yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting, you know, that that whole piece of it's been just kind of, not, not bizarre, but just interesting to me um, because before I even launched my project, when I kind of put my website up, like, hey, I'm doing this project. It's called The Impossible First. I'm going to try to be the first person to cross solo, unsupported, mm-hmm. and unaided, which has been something pe- multiple people have tried before me. I didn't just, like, create this random thing out of thin air. Um, and I said, you know, there's been, like, five expeditions that I want to highlight that have been, like, exceptionally inspirational to me and like the top one on this is on my website before i take any single step in antarctica it's like what borg Ausland did in 1996 borg, uh-huh. and I, I might get his name not perfect yeah, like Bor- borg Ausland, i think mm-hmm. is it's norwegian um you know this is what he did in 1996 1997 like i explicitly called it out um as one of the expeditions that's been most uh inspirational to me what he did um then was he crossed not only the landmass of antarctica but also the entirety of the ice sheets of the frozen ocean that i mentioned he crossed that and he was able to do so using kite and so, um, you know, he oftentimes went, you know, there's a lot written on this. New York Times actually covered it. There's lots of quotes about him. Um, and he used these parasails um, that actually took him sometimes 150, 200 miles per day. He did that entire crossing almost twice the distance that I went um, in almost the exact amount of time. Um, and he's been, you know, he's on the record quoting like, oh, it would be impossible to cross both ice sheets as well, just man hauling unsupported. Um, but in his sense, he's like, but I was the first person to cross Antarctica. Uh-huh solo. And I'm like, you absolutely were like, these are just apples and oranges. I was purely manhauling, crossing the landmass and you were using kite and wind aid. By the way, that's extraordinary what you accomplished. I'm not trying to take away anything from that. Like I said, to me, it's just apples and oranges. And again, even without even knowing that there was any sort of, you know, quote unquote controversy, which to me is like pretty minimal anyways, but you know, there's some chatter about that. Um, the day after I finished my project, I had to finish on December 26th and I posted the Instagram of, you know, I finished, you know, wow, what a day or something like that. And then the following day, again, not knowing anything about controversy, I was in my own little bubble, just writing from my tent, whatever popped in my mind. And I wrote this post on December 27th that's called standing on the shoulders of giants. And it was like, wow, like it's amazing to step into the history books and do this, you know, this world first that no one had done before, but none of this happens without all the other pioneering explorers and the amazing things they've done. And I called out Borga Osland. I called out uh, Felicity Ashton, who's a woman who did a Mm -hmm. supported but solo crossing of Antarctica on a very similar route, which was amazing. So she had two resupplies of food Um, and just calling out these other explorers that have been inspirational to me. So for me, the only way that I can, you know, kind of reflect on that, which is like, it's not a controversy in my mind. Like I've been nothing but very clear that Borga Olsen and what he did was inspirational and incredible. He used a kite. I didn't. Like he went further. I went a shorter distance, but man hauled only, crossed the landmass. He Across the ice sheets. I mean, they're both like, I mean, it's like splitting hairs over like, you know, it was like the slam dunk at the all-star game in 96 when Jordan did it cooler than like when this, other, you know, it's like, it's just like, they're awesome. Like we, can't we yeah. all just like celebrate these, these moments of, of achievement that are unique and interesting in their own ways. Yeah. I gotcha. Um, after doing this whole thing, it must've been freaky the first time you were back on the mainland and it was actually, it got dark at night. Yes. Right. Yes. That, was yes. that weird? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, that was that was absolutely uh, bizarre. Uh, this twenty four hours of daylight out there. I actually got quite accustomed to it and used to it. Um, but you could, I could, 
easily see how people lose their minds with that. Yes, yes. I mean, I had to have, you know, an eye mask over my eyes and try to like, your body is just like not right. adapted to doing that. The one the one cool benefit, which we haven't we hadn't spoke about uh, yet, but uh, was that final push that I made um, oh, yeah, on the last day. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about that. So you do this crazy 32 hour push to finish. Yeah, so I woke up on Christmas day actually, and I'm 77 miles away from the finish. And I think, oh, you know, I've been averaging about 10 to 12, or sorry, about 15 to 16 miles per day average throughout the mm-hmm. entire project. But my sled was lighter and I was beginning to go downhill a little bit. And I was like, oh, maybe I could do about 25 miles per day. That's probably like three more days and I could finish this thing. But for me, like my guard is still way up. Like Henry Worsley, you know, fell ill 100 miles from the finish line. It's like this thing isn't done until it's done. Um, and I wake up that morning on Christmas morning and I just tap into this this deep flow state. And your question was about, you know, how to, if, if people getting things wrong in the media. And I don't think they're getting things wrong, but there's this, this state that I'm trying to describe of this sort of deep flow state. And I think, you know, athletes, other high performers, you know, musicians, mm-hmm. things have felt that. But sometimes people are like, what are you, like, what is this like crazy, like weird abstraction that you're talking about? Um, but, you know, for me, it's just waking up and having just this moment of like true, like confidence and clarity of this. Like I start calculating in my head. I'm like, okay, like, people have run ultra marathons before, like the sun's never going to set. Like, could I just do 32 hours straight or 30 some hours straight to finish this thing in one go? And it seemed crazy other than the fact that even though my body was so exhausted, I was running low on food, but I had just enough to kind of, you know, push through a couple more, you know, a couple more days. And I just locked in to this place in my mind that was just like calm and collected. And I was in complete silence and really just taking in the moment. And it was Mm -hmm. this beautiful moment where I felt like all of the experiences of my entire life were stacking that, you know, five-year-old kid jumping into the swimming pool that, you know, my burn accident and the lessons for that, family relationships, love, heartbreak, like just all of the moments, the meditation practice, the training with Mike, like all of these things were stacking this way that I finally eventually reached this, this moment of just utter and complete calm and focus. So I, I go on through the day, you know, 10 hours, 15 hours, 18 hours, and that's the longest I've ever gone. And finally, this massive storm blows up. There's actually this huge ground blizzard comes out of nowhere. Wind kicks up because it had been a calm, nice day when I sort of got this idea in my yeah. mind I pushed through. And I get stuck in this crazy storm. And it's now midnight, which means it's seven. It's midnight Chilean time, the time zone I stayed on, but it's still 24 hours of daylight. But it's 7 p.m. back home in Oregon, and it's Christmas Day. And so my family has been tracking this satellite tracker throughout the day. And they're like, he didn't stop after 12 hours, didn't stop after uh-huh. 13 hours, like 18 hours. So I call home um, after 18 hours because what happens is I actually ran out of water. And the only way for me to get more water in the middle of this storm was to set up my tent and light my stove inside of my tent. So I set up my tent get inside, call home, and it's Christmas dinner. My family's at Christmas dinner. So my Jenna puts a phone on speaker and it's like my mother, my sisters, you know, Jenna, you know, these incredibly strong women that have like supported me throughout my life. I have five older sisters. So um, I just have been, uh, been, been raised by an incredible, incredible um, people and women particularly um, in this case. And, you know, they get on the phone and they're like, you did 47 miles. Like this is your best day ever. You're going to finish tomorrow or the next day. Like incredible. And I was like, actually, like I'm going to keep going. And they're like, wait, what? And I was like, I'm in this, you know, this, this really focused state. Like I know I can do it. And it's just in that moment we talked about sort mm-hmm. of Jenna pushing me to put those boots back on before where she, uh, when she describes this moment, you know, she's actually videotaped all of our conversations on, on her end so we could re- reflect on them afterwards. It's kind of a video diary. Um, and she was like, I just heard it in your voice. Like, I've seen you high perform. I've seen you broken down. She was like, there was something in your voice. You sounded stronger on day 53 than you had felt sounded the entire time. And so they just said to me like, all right. But they just said like, oh, the weather must be really good. And I was like, actually, it's like some of the worst of the whole project, but I'm going to go back out there. But even though it was storming and raging outside of my tent, I had this inner calm that made all the difference. So I got outside my tent, took my tent back down after boiling the water and made another 12 hours, ultimately a 32 hour and 77 mile continuous push, push to uh, finish it up. Yeah. And as much as Jenna is there to push you and say, put your boots on and keep going, she's also there to put the brakes on. Exactly. If, if, if you know, she gets the sense that this is going to be unsafe yeah. because 
people do lose their minds out there yes. and get ahead of themselves. And that's ultimately how people die. Yeah, my sister, Caitlin, she had said to me, and she was amazing, she actually built all that mapping stuff. If you ever went to the live tracker during mm-hmm. the project, she she built all that. And um, she, she had actually said to me a few days before that, she's like, I think you're going to finish this thing. And it looks like you have a margin of error that you're ahead of, of Lou, so you'll finish first. Unless you do something stupid, like just go continuously so long that you tie yourself right. out and fall yeah. apart. And so, of course, it's like also in the back like of my mind, like, my doing out, one you know, thing? a half like, mile from the <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Um, but it was it was weird. It's hard to, again, I'm still, this is one of the things I'm still trying to reflect on and try to, hopefully, I'll put it more articulately into, articulately into words in, in book form. Um, but to describe that state, that state of just like, just knowing and calm and feeling, again, that sort of resonant positivity from the universe, the people cheering me on, the fact that it was, you know, Christmas, I think, on that day and people were gathered and celebrating with their family and their loved ones. There was just something about this sort of magic moment um, that all came to pass of this, all these moments stacking in a beautiful way that allowed me to, you know, push through um, 77 miles straight in 32 mm-hmm. hours to get to the finish line. And it was for me a beautiful way as someone who's curious about exploring the the limits uh, that we all have inside of us to kind of break through uh, a perceived limit in my own life and show that I had even more in the tank at the end than I really even thought possible. What's next? <laughs> What's next? No one's yeah, ever asked me that yeah. question. What's next? <laughs> now you got to go. You got to top it now, right? You know, I think that it's a, a dangerous game in this world to yeah. try to be always one-upping oneself. Um, you know, it's no been doubt. it's been a blessing to, you know, have these these world records and this this world first and things that I've done. Um, but uh, but it's, as somebody, in fairness, yeah. because you've gone from one thing to the next to the next to the next without yeah. like even a breather in between. Yes. This is like the first break you've taken. Yeah. Yes, and it's it, only because you're in like media demand, right? <laughs> if, if the phone wasn't ringing, you'd probably be out. You know, you know, I have, you know, I have some ideas, of course, in the back of my mind, uh-huh. fluttering about about other expeditions and things. But it is really, like I said, the the storytelling and the, and the sharing of of this is is humbling that people want to hear the story, um, and it's amazing to have a moment to do that. And certainly, you know, with diving into a book and things like that, as you know, like require a dedicated focus in that. And so, um, it's nice, and also in a moment when I need to recover my body a bit to have mm-hmm. a, a more of a still activity to do. You know, I'm, I turned 34 next week, so I'm 33 right now. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a lo- long life ahead of me uh, of adventures and explorations and, and all sorts of different things. But I also, like I said, I don't, I don't, um, you know, and, and maybe this is why there's controversies with the likes of the Burger Oslands or whatever, is that, you know, I don't necessarily think of myself as this endemic outdoor athlete. You know, you know, I was doing triathlon. I love professional triathlon, but I didn't necessarily think of myself as a triathlon insider as well. I think there's going to be many chapters in my life where I can express myself through physical demands, through, you know, business, through interpersonal relationships. And so what's next is hopefully a, a full and complete life and things that bring me joy and that I can reflect that back out into the world. Well, this canvas that you're painting, this art uh, expression uh, that is the manifestation of your expeditions and the way you're living your life is a, is a beautiful thing, man. So uh, I salute you. Uh, I'm so proud and honored to be your friend. And it was really cool to see you get out there and accomplish that. But I think what touches me more than anything is the way that you're now out there really trying to inspire people uh, and and help them redefine uh, their own sense of potential and frame new stories around ultimately, you know, what we're all capable of. Absolutely. So for that, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for having cool. me. It's, it's a blessing. I, I have to say this one last thing, which is, I, like I said, I didn't listen to much out there, but I did listen to my fair share of ritual podcasts. And I appreciate that. <laughs> generally, generally, you know, I sometimes, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, but I would pass through the ads from uh-huh. time to time. Yeah. And You're the only one. I... <laughs> I had them all memorized. So you do that MeUndies commercial and I'd be like, I have one pair of underwear. Wouldn't it be nice to have some MeUndies right now? And like your final closing Every credits. Word. Yeah, I had it all the words down. Your closing credits and music by Anna Lima and the whole thing. <laughs> I, yeah, so I wish I could record the the outro, uh-huh. but uh, I had it all in my head. I should have moment. you just come in and do it for me. <laughs> Honestly, it would be a load music off. by Jason Camiolo. <laughs> and the, 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 that's hilarious, man. Oh, it's the best, Well, cool. Man. Well, thanks for that, man. And uh, come back anytime, man. Uh, when the book's when the book comes out, come back, share with me. Would love that. And uh, we'll keep this conversation rolling. Absolutely. My Thank you, my friend. All right, peace. So, 
you're a super easy guy to find at Colin O'Brady. Yeah. Um, Instagram's probably the best place, but ColinO'Brady.com is the at, website. That's right. And I'm sure if you're doing any speaking engagements that are open to the public, they'll be up on your website. Yeah, ColinO'Brady.com has got everything about my speaking at Colin O'Brady on Instagram. I love hearing from people. I read all my DMs, reach out, say hello. Um, this community you've built is such extraordinary people. And uh, when I got going on my first project, was one of the first early supporters was your mm. podcast listeners. So have such uh, so much love and compassion for this community. It's just uh, the perfect vibration and resonance with me. So all the love to everyone out there. And uh, thanks for all the support over awesome, the years. Man. Appreciate that yeah. much love my friend uh peace plants and colin bars yeah <laughs>